long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is Constant Reader Scott Daly, and at the way station between worlds, I am joined once again by my co-host and King newbie, Matt Freeman. Matt, how's it going this week? I'm just excited to talk about part three of The Gunslinger today. Oh, you didn't see that coming, did uh, you? No, that was a surprise. That was a curveball. In fact, it was almost like a double curveball because you uh, your audiobook messed up the the end point of the chapters and you almost didn't even get to that part of of the chapter. That's a good thing for us to mention right up front, actually. Uh, yeah. The audiobook was just completely screwed up and I stopped my reading almost uh, like, I don't know, many, many. Uh, uh, what's the what, what, what are we, what, what are we using for the. The part of a chapter? Uh, I believe they're called pages, Matt. No. Pages. This, like the sections. <laughs> <laughs> Several sections prior to the actual end of, of this week's reading. So, um, Yeah, Callahan's th- entire trip to Midworld was not in uh, your thing. Yeah. So if you're going by audiobook and you're trying to keep up with us, go back to the audiobook and listen further. <laughs> And listen more. Yeah. Um, we actually got a very, a very nice email from a listener um, named Nick. Um, like, it, it's so funny, Matt. Like, it came in yesterday at around six o'clock, which was, I think, like, maybe maybe an hour before, but maybe almost the exact time where you recognized that this was happening. It, like, like hit yeah. at, at the, I think I saw, at least I saw the email at the same time you were telling me, uh, yeah. there's something weird going on here. It's because I was going through the script and I saw your notes and I was like, wait a second, that didn't happen. And, <laughs> and, then, and then we fixed it and it's all better now. Yes, we did. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. This is why we have a buffer day in our recording schedule in case... In case stuff like this happens, uh-huh. we can still get the episode out on time. Well, anyway, folks, this week we are discussing chapters eight and nine of part two of Wolves of the Cala, the, the, the section called Telling Tales. We're completing part two, Telling Tales. In this section, Jake confronts Roland about the secrets he's been keeping and gets a lesson in growing up. Then Roland gets to visit the unfound door and we finally hear the conclusion of Callahan's exciting story. Matt, what did you think of these two chapters, all of them, the whole chapters, not just the part where the, the audio book cut out. Yeah. I mean, on the whole, um, the, the first part in particular, I think I found frustrating and I mean, I, you're, you're meant to, right? Because mm-hmm. we're, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to talk about this, but you, you really, at least at the end of last week, I remember like, we were just like, yeah, like th- this is, this is obviously setting us up for this big sort of reconciliation amongst the group members. And, um, that doesn't happen. In fact, yeah. kind of the opposite. So, uh, so yeah, fr- frustration and um, and and kind of sadness at the at the direction that things are going at this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then of course Callahan's tale um, comes to a very fascinating ending. Right, he ends up in the way station. We see Roland and Jake from the Gunslinger in the distance. We meet up with the Man in Black. There's a lot of crazy stuff here. I think that portion of this the notes i just like grabbed six quotes and i'm like i'm not going to write anything we're just going to talk about this because there's a lot there's a whole lot to talk about here yeah there's a lot of interesting stuff this week where we have like our most overt ever reference to the crimson king and we have Mm -hmm. this moment of like the man in black showing like a sliver of humanity for the first time ever it's it's uh, weirdly a lot of sort of focus on the villains this week yeah definitely definitely um, it's going to be a fun reading. I can't wait. I, I'm I'm really loving this book. I really am. I don't think I've ever liked this book as much as I have on this reread. Mm-hmm. So it's been a lot of fun. Cool. So let's just jump right into it and talk about chapter eight titled Tuke's Store, The Unfound Door, which kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Yeah. So chapter eight begins the morning after chapter seven left off as Roland and Jake are making their way back from Eisenhart's ranch. Um, Jake decides that in this moment, he's going to confront Roland about the things that he was talking about at the end of last chapter. Um, they see th- all these things that were bothering him. He decides this is the moment and he's going to confront Roland about it. Yeah, I think that basically, like I was just saying last week, we expected this to happen. We, we, we were thinking, OK, Jake realizes something's wrong. He's going to try to talk to Roland, but doesn't go the way that we uh, hoped it would. No, not at all. I mean, I think it's so it's such a fascinating conversation that like both Roland and Jake know that 
Roland manipulated Jake into doing what he wanted to do mm-hmm. in a way. And they're just like, uh, I guess there's nothing else I could do about it. Like, it's just it's it's another one of those conversations where Roland, as he's saying things to Jake, is interjecting in, 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 in the narrative saying, oh, it's killing me to do this. It's killing me to be this mean to him. And yet he just keeps <laughs> he just keeps on doing it. Mm-hmm. Yep. So first, Jake asks to speak Don Din uh, to to Roland, which Roland defines to us as um, uh, as as turn to your leader f- for some insoluble emotional problem, usually having to do with a love affair, turning this over to one's Din. When one did this, he or she agreed to do exactly as the Din suggested immediately and without question. So I think Jake's Jake has gathered the meaning of this word Um from Roland's head, he like he used his shining, his touch to uh, to read Roland's mind a little bit here. And I think that's really interesting because we, we've we've long known, I think, since even in back in the gunslinger that Jake was strong in the touch. But this chapter really pushes that to the forefront. Right. We see he says here that Jake is stronger than Elaine ever was. And uh, he can read people's minds quite easily if he wants to. He just kind of doesn't do that. He feels like it's an invasion of privacy and he doesn't do it. Um, Roland speculates that he's had a power up in this be- because of the rose. Um, and Jake kind of just agrees with that. That's interesting, right? Like we hadn't uh, the rose is powering up his 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 superpower. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, Ro- Roland has been attributing a lot of stuff to the rose recently. There mm-hmm. was that moment last week where he was like he has this intuition and he's just like, oh, yeah, it was the rose. Um, I mean, it's entirely possible that he's right. Uh, I, I, but I mean, it is I, like one thing I notice is like, well, they're also in in relatively close proximity to this super powerful evil artifact, the <laughs> the Black Thirteen. Sure. So like that could be causing it just as well, right? I mean, it, you know, it, it it's it's um in my mind, maybe I'm being paranoid. Like it could just be the rose, but I I, I do wonder um if that has something to do with it. I also kind of wanted to note that like Jake is so preoccupied and, and like anxious with all, all the present challenges that he doesn't really, he doesn't really like take a moment to appreciate like, holy shit, I can read people's minds easily now. Like it's, it's like if you got amazing telepathic abilities, I think you would, you would be like, you know, kind of interested in exploring those, but he's just so, um, you know, fixated on the problems they're having that it doesn't even really cross his mind. Yeah, I mean, I think like there's a certain part of him, I think, that like has maybe just been quietly and silently dealing with this on his own um, and has just kind of built his own rules and regulations for them without really saying anything like that's kind of what he's saying to Roland here is like, yeah, like I could I, I don't I don't try to pry into people's minds if I if I. Can, and I can control it enough to not do that. I just kind of pick up things on the edges or if I concentrate, I can maybe get something a little deeper. Um, but so, yeah, it, it is interesting. He's kind of just dealt with it and he's just like, this is something that I have. This is part of who I am now and I'm just dealing with it silently. It's not this is not I'm not bringing the stuff up to you, Roland, to talk about my psychic powers. I'm mm-hmm. bringing the stuff up to talk about how our cotet is failing. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess maybe that's a better way of uh, of saying what I was trying to say. Like it's it's interesting that Jake is this character who who is just sort of off to the side dealing with like heavy shit and not necessarily letting us know that he's doing so. Yeah, yeah. Um, he just he just is dealing with it. That's kind of who he is. Like he's always been this loner, this person mm-hmm. who who keeps to himself. And even now, even at this point in time when he is supposed to be able to rely on the cotet, he's still kind of deals with these struggles on his own um yeah definitely yeah. um and i think maybe like one of the things that's interesting about this is is roland specifies that don din is specifically like you're turning over your decision to your leader you're saying i'm unsure of what i i'm having a problem i'm not sure what to do and i am going to give this to you my leader to make the decision for me and it's interesting because i think I think Jake doesn't fully understand that. Like he's kind of picked up the word from Roland and he doesn't have a complete understanding of what it means. And that's really not what he's trying to do here. Like he's, he's actually, I think trying to confront him about the secret keeping he's been doing. And I think phrasing it this way kind of allows Roland to, to like have an advantage in this argument where he can fall back on this thing and said, no, you said Don Din. I I told you like, this is, you have to do what I say now here. You have to accept what I say. 
that's tough, tough, buddy. Um, I, I think that's just interesting because he's using these words and he's speaking these phrases that he doesn't fully understand. He just has like a, a taste of it. Um, yeah. And, and Roland is, is definitely using that, using his weakness in that regard. You get the sense that he thinks that he's saying like, I want to speak to you seriously, man to man, and mm-hmm. doesn't realize that he's ab- ab- abdicating responsibility essentially by saying yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah, which which we'll see. Roland just like abdicates right back. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, I, I, so I find this whole conversation really fascinating because, like we said, it doesn't go the way Jake thinks it's going to go. He he starts off slowly admitting that he's found out about Mia. He was in the castle with her in the dream. I love the way he does this. He says, it's like, where is the castle is the first thing he says to him. And I think it's kind of a way again, the text doesn't say this, but to me, it's kind of a way for him to like gauge how much Roland knows because he has a feeling Roland and Eddie know but he doesn't know for sure. And like, it's just a great way to like drop the, the, the load onto Roland here. He's like, here's how much I know. Where's the castle from? Yeah. It's, it's he's, he's cutting to the chase. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's cutting past a lot of boring, uh, setup conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I love how King builds the momentum of the conversation. Like here at the very beginning of this talk, King says, here they were on East Road, less than a mile from where Red Molly Doolin had once killed a wolf out of the thunderclap. Here they were facing one another, facing each other, rather. So Roland is framing this conversation as a conflict, a confrontation, a battle. He's comparing it to a a battle that happened last time. Um, And and that battle last time left the defending force almost completely dead right yeah um there was just one person that luckily survived so like who's on the offense and who's on the defense in this battle on this new battle on east road yeah it's really surprising the the tone right from the beginning of this interaction it is not this sort of chummy like relaxed like sort of father-son bonding tone that i think with that i expected that we've been kind of um uh, trained to expect between these two in the last couple of books. I, I think it's almost like we're back to this this tense feeling, the, this feeling of how things were between them underneath the the mountain before he dropped he, he before he dropped Jake the first time. It's yeah, it's yeah. strained. They're failing to communicate. Um, it's really a, a regression, actually. In fact, I think I'm going to say the word regression a bunch of times this week because I feel like that's <laughs> that's what's happening with Roland in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. It, it is. It, it's shocking. It like if if you had I think if we had kind of speculated last week about how we thought this conversation was going to go, I don't think we either either of us would have thought like this. Um, right. I think I think we were kind of comforted by the fact that Jake finished that chapter saying, I'm going to talk to him and I'm going to try to convince him that this is what we need to do. Uh, yeah, I felt like it was going to be triumphant. Everybody was going to realize they'd been making mistakes. We're going to pull together. Um, no, n- nothing like that. Yeah, I-, I really like this moment, too. And I think this kind of this also serves to set the tone for this conversation. Roland says, if you w- would speak to me, Don Din, tell me everything you saw in your dream and everything that troubled you about it upon waking. Then I'll give you the wisdom of my heart. Such wisdom as I have. You won't. Roland, you won't scold me. This time, Roland was unable to conceal his astonishment. No, Jake, far from it. Perhaps I should ask you not to scold me. Scold is such a charged word to use here, right? The connotation is like immediately childish, immediately father son. You won't you wouldn't scold your adult fully grown son, would you, Matt? You'd scold your child. And this is like Jake has been throughout this book, like teetering back and forth on the edge of childhood and adulthood throughout these chapters. And this is one of those moments where like how we're treating him are we treating jake like an adult are we treating jake like a child and it keeps kind of going back and forth depending on the scene yeah i mean at least here in this moment roland trying to kind of tries to extend some generosity and is is like Mm -hmm. no i i I wouldn't scold you but i mean i think i think roland is kind of trying to treat him like an adult here what's interesting i don't know if i fully stand by this statement but, but i think what's interesting is maybe this is a moment where Roland needs to be more like a father Mm -hmm. and instead he takes the position of being more like an equal and that's like in in some other moment that might have been the right choice but that's not what is that's not what's needed right now yeah yeah I don't know 
Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to think on that. I mean, I do think like this this sentence here, perhaps I should ask you not to scold me is is immediately self-deprecating here. Like Roland is being confronted about the choices he's made, choices that he kind of knew were wrong, um, but felt right in the moment to keep this stuff from people and to keep secrets from the rest of his content. And so he he starts the conversation kind of saying, no, like when we finish this conversation, it's me that it's going to need to be scolded. But that's not his attitude throughout the rest of the, the conversation, though. His attitude is kind of defensive. It's like, no, there was perfectly reasonable explanations for keeping the things I kept from you. Right. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, it's, it, and the thing is, we know that he feels shame. In fact, yeah, the, the word yeah. shame is used in this conversation, and I think it's used at the end of the well not at the, yeah cl- close to the end of the week's reading where where Susanna makes her confession and he and he thinks to himself that you know he he's ashamed at this and it's like the 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 motif here is him not handling things properly and feeling ashamed about it but like not knowing what else to do um, yeah yeah i mean it it is it is quite alarming when Roland, our 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 kind of rock in this the story, just freely admits, I I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I don't I I don't know. I have no idea what the right move is here, and I'm relying on you a little bit here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to talk uh, about about so so basically Jake is going to he decides he's going to tell him everything. But because of the way Roland phrased something, uh, speak to me about everything you saw in your dream and everything that troubled you about it upon waking. Jake sees a loophole here where he says, I don't have to tell him about the conversation I saw between Slightman, the elder and Andy, the robot. And so he elects to keep that secret from him as well. So what do you think about that? I guess it's not really that surprising since like the long and short of the whole conversation is basically like, uh, you know, nah, despite Jake's pointing out that the Katet is broken because they're keeping secrets, Roland is just going to double down on keeping secrets. And mm-hmm. seeing that that's the case, Jake is just going to get in on that because why not? Yeah. Yeah. But like, it, it, or, or another phrase, another way of framing it is that, is that Roland really doesn't give Jake any reason to trust him in this conversation. Like, so so why would he volunteer more than he has to? Especially because Roland has set up, like he pointed out, this adversarial framing where they're like yeah. standing across from each other like like adversaries. Um but yeah. sort of put him in a mode where he's wanting to, to keep things back rather than wanting to share everything. Yeah, and it's it's God, it's so fascinating because like another thing we have to point out is that Eddie has still not told us or anyone else what the fucking wolves are <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah so, so like, strange right he didn't he didn't see roland and say roland roland guess what i learned like this is this is good it's really important roland um i think it uh, goes to show once again what we talked about last week which is like these people are just keeping things from each other yeah. they're just not telling each other things that in any other situation in any other moment in the story i think they would have just freely shared this information with each other yeah and they're just not doing it yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, just to, to step back and talk about it on the on the level of what King might be trying to say with this with this story, I think it's like, it, it, once there's any small crack in the trust of a of, of a friendship, um, or you know, a, a kind of web of friendships in this case, mm-hmm. that can be all that's needed to kind of cause like a cascade failure and yeah yeah um i mean i'm also of course reminded of the idea that this is a story about addiction you know uh, roland is this tower junkie and it strikes me that like one of the things that's going to crop up in a situation where you have addicts as your characters and addiction as your theme is you know li- little lies little inconsequential lies to, to, to cover up the addiction very quickly snowball into sort of lead, leading a double life situation. And yeah, yeah. I feel like one of the things King is talking about with this book is this idea of like, you're, you're kind of either all in with people or you're not. It's, it really is pretty binary uh, at least, yeah. at least as far as, you know, if you, if you need to be able to trust people and you show them, you can't really trust me a hundred percent. It's like, well, then they're not going to trust you. There's no 99%. There's, there's trust or not. Yeah, especially amongst a group that you could say is like a proxy, like 
family a a group yeah like yeah family sure but like they're also like they're supporting each mm-hmm. other they're leaning on each other you could argue that they like some of them are sponsoring other ones of them mm-hmm. um like and, mm-hmm. and yeah you start lying to your sponsor you start lying to your group you start hiding things from I, them i i think um, i like that more than family because it, it, it by definition it's a group of people who found each other through their struggles and hardships whereas yeah, you know yeah. a family a, you know a typical family is people who were are, are related um yeah and and again i think we're going to talk about this a lot at the end of callahan's story but just to preface that conversation i think this is why callahan and his story just slot so perfectly to me into what's happening here with the quartet like he is just this wonderful kind of example of of everything that we're talking about here Mm -hmm. yep um so so jake tells him basically what his principal fear is that the three of them knowing and one of them not their quartet was broken just when it needed to be the most solid he even told roland the old joke guy without a blowout saying it's only flat on the bottom he didn't expect roland to laugh and his expectations were met admirably in this regard but he sensed roland was to some degree ashamed and jake found this frightening he had an idea shame was pretty much reserved for people who didn't know what they were doing um which he turns out to be spot on there Mm -hmm. um and then this conversation happens and until last night he was even worse Worse than three in and one out, Jake said, because you were trying to keep me out as well, weren't you? No, Roland said. No, I simply let things be as they were. And Matt, this is not true. <laughs> like, like, perhaps he could argue that that when it comes to Mia and Susanna's pregnancy, that is technically true. That he didn't make a conscious decision to leave Jake out of it. He just made a conscious decision to do nothing. But he is still keeping Jake out. He's still keeping Jake out of his his dry twist that he's hiding from everyone. He's still keeping Jake out of his secret plan that, that he's hiding from everyone in the content as well. He's 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 feigning innocence here. He's, he's uh, the whole part of this conversation is him basically saying, no, I didn't consciously choose to lie to you, Jake. I just didn't know what to do. And when it comes to Ka, if you don't know what to do, do nothing. He's lying again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that I I really hope that this movement of the story is the part where Roland learns a valuable lesson about, what it actually means to trust people, because I think a, a big thing here is he still has this attitude where he is the competent one who is responsible for everything. And that's actually mm-hmm. getting in his way here because he, he, you know, instead of, instead of finding out about, um, Susanna's issue and being like, all right, well, f- immediately I need to trust my content that we're going to handle this together. We need to have a, a palaver. He's like, all right, I, I need to, manage this and i need to start you know i need to be the one who manages it i need to to partition information and and use people the way i need to use them and um that's yeah that's always been a kind of a a big a major i would say flaw of his is um he he had you know he's come to admire eddie but he doesn't really trust eddie he doesn't yeah he, he wouldn't he he's he's confident that eddie can do certain things but he's not confident with eddie to just be able to handle a problem like this and the thing is i think that's unfair because i think eddie probably could i think i think together the content could handle this yeah i mean we saw that eddie's reaction to this was reasonable yeah and like like he was upset at being lied to he was scared for the woman he loves but he was like okay i got it i understand okay what are we gonna do like it was a perfectly reasonable reaction to being told a very <laughs> insane, scary thing that that uh, your wife is pregnant with a demon baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to go back to our addiction metaphor we were talking about, this would kind of be like Roland catches Susanna walking into a bar and instead of confronting her about it, instead of going back to the group and saying, hey, team, we need to get together and support her because she's she's falling apart a little bit here. He elects to keep that to himself and try to figure out a way, try to figure out what he needs to do. Yeah. You know, like how, how he can how he can protect himself. Um, yeah. And that's not a great look. Yeah. Yeah. I like that framing. Um, and, you know, just to go back to the, the, the idea of shame. Um, I mean, in part, I think that, you know, 
Jake is psychically sensing that he actually feels shame, right? It's not just like he seems like he's ashamed. He's like, oh, he actually is ashamed. He's ashamed because he's continuing to lie. Um, And it's, and, and Roland doesn't know what he's doing. And the whole thing really reminds me of like young Hambry Roland, actually. That's, that's what I meant earlier about a regression is like this Roland feels like ever since the, the, um, the, the, these Kala folk came across them, maybe even a little bit before that, he's just really been regressing back to kind of, uh, uh, that, that Roland who, you know, kept his own counsel. He was kind of, he was kind of, you know, off in cloud cuckoo land, not really communicative with his cotet. And, um, and we saw what happened there. And so that's, that's yeah. the main thing that scares me about it is how much, this like this is this is like no Roland that we've seen in this story except for extremely young stupid Roland. I mean, we I think this this next quote like ties exactly into what you're talking about here because he Roland says, "I am your din. I know it." Jake nearly shouted, "Don't you think I know it? And do you think I like it?" Roland asked almost as heatedly. "Do you not see how much easier all this was before?" He trailed off, appalled by what he had nearly said. "Before we came," Jake said. His voice was flat. Well, guess what? We didn't ask to come, none of us. And I didn't ask you to drop me into the dark either, to kill me. Jake, the gunslinger sighed, raised his hands, dropped them back to his thighs. So, I mean, speaking of regression here, in this moment he's saying, this would all be so much fucking easier if I was on my own again. Mm -hmm. Um, Which he basically had come to realize multiple times throughout the story so far was bad for him. And that being surrounded by these people had taught him how to love again, had taught him how to live again and had like taught him so much and and made him realize how much of his life he was missing by like being this loner wandering midworld chasing after the man in black. And now he's like, Oh, so much easier back then before I didn't have to deal with you people. Yeah. I mean, I know that we're really hammering on Roland this week, but, uh, (laughs) Like, he deserves it. He deserves it. Like this, the, the last line that you read there, you know, side raised his hands and dropped them back to his thighs. I really want to go back through this whole series and nail down every time Roland does this gesture, this, <laughs> this raising his hands and then dropping them gesture. It, it because it's basically a shrug. It's a very characteristic Roland shrug. It's a, it's a special shrug that I think he reserves for moments where he's being a complete coward and abdicating responsibility. Mm-hmm. usually specifically advocating responsibility to Ka. Like, yeah, like yeah. guys, I'm doing the gesture with my hands. What do you want me to do? It's <laughs> Ka. And it's like, come on, Roland, grow up. Yeah, I mean, it's so fast. Like, we know Ka is a real thing, right? And we know Ka is is a power and a force that that you you, the individuals in the story, are almost powerless to fight against. But it doesn't mean you don't take action right like that's what that's been true from the beginning you still have you still can make choices you still can take action and to just like say that like this kind of reminds me of the the story of the guy stuck on the roof praying to god and got like three people on boats come by and he's like no 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 god's gonna come for me and it's like you have the god is is sending you boats roland he's 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 he specifically ka has sent you jake he has sent you Susanna. he has sent you eddie because these are key things you need on your quest to the tower and in this moment when he sees his his katet faltering and when he's unsure and uncertain about what to do his choice is just to be like i got i just gotta go with ka and ka's probably like listen to these people you idiot (laughs) trust in trust in this group that i've sent you yeah yeah maybe i i'm I'm a little more ambivalent about what ka wants exactly but uh sure yeah i mean sure right i mean you've got to assume that if 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 Ka and Ka Tet are related, then the then Ka wants to use this Ka Tet as a tool, and by breaking it, Roland has done something dumb. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, me personally, you know, and, and I know Roland is not me, but if I if I am like if I am trying to decide a direction that I want our podcasting media group to go right, and I am uncertain about what what I think is best for us, I usually will go to my partner, you, uh-huh. and be like, hey. Um, I'm not sure what to do in this moment. What do you think? Yeah. And the fact that he's just like, no, he's just not doing that. I think it's really telling. Yeah. That's an extremely bad sign for a cotet and for a podcasting partnership, which is of course a cotet. 
So indeed. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, we'll, we'll stop being mean to Roland here pretty soon, but it's just, it's just, it's so easy. I mean, this is like the worst he's been in a long time. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's necessary. Yeah. So Roland eventually like agrees that the three of them will confront Susanna about this, will tell Susanna about Mia before the wolves come, which kind of makes Jake happy. But then he like immediately puts the responsibility for that decision back on Jake. You believe Susanna should be told. I, on the other hand, don't know what to do in this matter. I've lost my compass when one knows and one does not. The one who does not must bow his head and the one who does must take responsibility. Do you understand me, Jake? And I love this because Roland in the past few chapters, since they've gotten to to the Kala, Roland has basically tried to give Jake one last bit of of boyhood, right? A childhood friend to make a, a fun day, a sleepover, a camp out and, and like jumping into the hay. But Jake came to him the next morning with adult worries and adult questions. And Roland is basically saying here, OK, OK, now it's the time for adult responsibility. Goodbye to the boy. Hello to Jake Chambers, the man, because here's the deal. If you're going to come to me and say, here's what I think we should do. And I think you were wrong for doing the opposite. Then you must take responsibility for that decision. That's just being a grown up, right? Mm -hmm. You have to take responsibility. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think that we've been primed all book long to expect that this book will be the Jake's loss of innocence book. Right. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. And I'm sure this isn't the worst thing that's going to happen to Jake in this book um, or the worst thing he's going to have to do. But uh, yeah, it's definitely this moment of um, may maybe that was it. Maybe Jake's already had his last moment of boyhood. So, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think I think it's a uh, it's a sign that that boyhood, like even even before this moment, it's a sign that, that just just the fact that he goes to his father or his king or his leader or or his friend with these with these questions he confronts him with this thing he has learned um shows to me some level of maturity some level of adulthood because like i don't think a kid would do that like i don't think i don't think one of your kids would come to you and challenge you in this kind of way no um i mean jake's always been mature in that way but sure. i think i think jake doing this and then Roland kind of throwing it back at him and being like well you're the man now dog um yeah <laughs> uh, uh is, is what is what makes this you know jake's childhood is over moment yeah yeah um and, and so this is the the end of the conversation right this is the wrap-up of the conversation and basically what did we get here so jake confronted roland about what he knew with the his main point was you're doing this and it's splintering the quartet and we need to be together more than ever. And what did Jake get out of this conversation? He got a very nebulous promise that we will tell Susanna about this before the wolves come. And that's it. That, that's it. Like Roland put like Roland acquiesces to that demand kind of, and then says, well, it's your responsibility. Um, while also keeping secrets still. Yeah. We know, we know he's, he's keeping secrets. Yeah. I'm, I, I, like Roland looks real bad here. It really sucks. This mm -hmm. is not how I wanted this to go. No, no, not at all. Not at all. But we are finally back with Eddie and we learn that thank God Susanna did not in fact eat a human child. Oh, thank Christ. <laughs> just, just a whole ass pig. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this, this line here. You know, Eddie's kind of tossing like he's he's turning over what happened last night in his head and he's in, in the light of day is is has calmed himself down a little bit. He says, and by daylight, the idea that Susanna could ever hurt a child seemed flat out ridiculous. I, I love this. This is something like I, I've obviously not had this exact feeling before, but like this thing that you're really stressed out at one point in your life and you're looking back on it the next day when you've calmed down a little bit or you've gotten to think about it and see it from a different angle. Um, it just kind of looks like, Oh, I was acting ridiculously there. I was acting a little over the top. The question here though is, was he? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I mean that was my like. It, it, it's almost like he's 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 trying to reassure himself, like, oh, right, this right. is ridiculous to worry about that because yeah, that's a, exactly. that's not a thing that I want to have to think about. And and that was my feeling as well, where you're like, yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she would never hurt a child right. ever. Yeah, like obviously, this is a danger. <laughs> Like, because she's yeah. still, and we know that she still needs, like, oh, she still needs that one last special thing for to to complete the becoming. <laughs> so, what is that? What is that supposed to be? Does that mean she does have to eat some like child or something <laughs> horrible like this? Uh, I, I mean, we don't know, and that's that's what worries us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then, suddenly, without warning, Roland looks at Zalia Jaffords and asks the final question. Do you ask aid and succor? The question was spoken without ostentation, almost conversationally, in fact, but Eddie felt his heart give a lurch, and when Susanna's hand crept into his, he squeezed it. Here was the third question, the key question, and it hadn't been asked of the callous big farmer, big rancher, or big businessman. It had been asked of a sodbuster's wife, with her mousy brown hair pulled back in a bun, a small-hold farmer's wife whose skin, although naturally dark, had even so cracked and coursed from too much sun, whose house dress had been faded by many washings. And it was right that it should be so perfectly right, because the soul of Calibrin Sturgis was in four dozen small farm, small-hold farms just like this, Eddie reckoned. Let Zalia Jafford speak for them all. Why the hell not? So you kind of had guessed originally that the reason why Roland was saving this, this question is because he was um, going to ask it of the children, right? The per- people that are actually in danger. Yeah. And so not exactly, but I, I do think this is close to that though, right? Like this is, this is Zalia Jaffords is the heart and soul of this place, the heart and soul of this town, a, a scared mother, a pow- she, we know she throws the plate. We, she's powerful. She's strong and she wants to protect her children. And that is, that is the soul of, of what this place yeah, is. I think it better, like, like I should have said something along the lines of like, he's not going to ask this question in like a big assembly. He's not going to ask this question of anybody important. Mm-hmm. Um, I did think it was going to be the kids because the kids are the ones who are actually going to be in danger. But I mean, asking it of the mother of of some of the kids uh, makes basically just as much sense because I mean, really, uh, we don't usually regard kids as being able to make decisions for themselves anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. So makes sense. She, she's a good proxy for that yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and of course, she says yes. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Roland leads the Tet away from Tian's farm and orders them to go into town to buy things from Tuke's store and, of course, to be seen. He, on the other hand, is going to talk with Henchik, leader of the Manny and finder of the unfound door. And to aid in their shopping spree, Roland pulls out, well, it's it's a magic item from Dungeons and Dragons, Matt. Uh-huh. It's it's a grow bag uh-huh. that seems to have enough gold and silver and gems for all they'll need at the store. What do you what do you think about this, Matt? You know, I've always had this lingering suspicion that Roland must have some radical shit in this bag. <laughs> I, I feel like I said something about this back when we talked about the gunslinger, but that was a hundred years ago. But like, you know, this big bag, which he calls, I believe he calls it his purse, right? Um, mm-hmm. Described at the very start of the series, and then King has been very careful that Roland keep this bag with him the whole time. You know, they forgot the damn wheelchair but we still have the bag. <laughs> um, so they've, you know, they've been in these absurdly tense and fast paced situations. The purse is still with us. Uh, what's funny is I never actually pictured Roland carrying this giant bag, like in, in my mm-hmm. mind's eye, although he's obviously doing so whenever they travel. Um, sure. But anyway, him having a magical dro- gr- grow bag. Sure. Why not? Yeah. It just, it's, it's, it's one of like the most transparent, simple, fantasy story metaphors i've seen in this book mm-hmm. right it's just like i'm not even metaphor metaphor is the wrong word it's just a magical artifact right. it's just but it's it's not even like for some reason the 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 glass balls feel different than me than this is just i mean maybe it's because it is so close to a literal D artifact yeah. um well but yeah uh, almost all of the magic that we've seen in this entire story has actually been like either like psychic stuff where there's no external manifestation um or or uh interdimensional doorways that that's like almost it right like i I can think of very few examples 
that are that are not either basically in people's minds or interdimensional stuff. So there being yeah. a D and D bag definitely feels like it's from a different, you know, world um, than everything mm-hmm. else. Yeah, you're right. This is tangible. This is a bag that appears empty, and yet when I turn it over again, gems will come out of it. Yeah. Like it is, it is, it is tangible magic in a way that that most of most everything else has been internal um like even even the the glass orbs yeah it's like you're seeing visions yeah. like things are things are being displayed in your head um kind of thing yeah. it, it is it does feel different yeah, yeah. the toe dash stuff so they sort of got got all fizzy and wobbly but as far as this you know as far as they're concerned they just kind of went somewhere else you know so mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's fun yeah it's fun yeah um so before we go on i just wanted to highlight and talk about this one little bit here Susanna says, it's going our way, isn't it? Yes, Susanna. If you ask them straight on as I ask Cy Jaffords, they'd not answer. So it's better to not ask, not yet. But yes, they mean to fight or or to let us fight for them, which can't be held against them. Fighting for those who can't fight for themselves is our job. Um, I think I think this last sentence is actually really, really important. Fighting for those who can't fight for themselves is our job. Because there is an argument to be made, and I've seen, you know, sometimes I like to, like, peruse the Goodreads reviews of these books and see what other people are saying about them, Mm -hmm. Um, especially the people that don't like them, because I am always inherently curious about someone's opinion when they don't like a thing I love. I just I really want to know why. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm just I'm just really curious, not because I, I feel the need to defend it to them. I'm just curious. Like, I loved this thing. I think it's unquestionably perfect why did you not like it but so one of the complaints i've seen about this book in particular is this is a quest for the dark tower and our characters are not going to the dark tower they are choosing to stay in this town for 20 something days theoretically and defend it from some wolf monsters things right um, why are they doing this? Why why are they signing up to defend this town? Why are they risking their lives in, in a utilitarian argument? If the tower falls, these people are all dead anyway, right? So so why is that not the most important thing? And I think I think Roland's quote is a, is our answer there, because if we remember all the way back in the drawing of the three, it's not just about getting to the tower. It's about who you are when you get there. Roland and Eddie and Susanna and Jake and even Oi, they're gunslingers. And this is what gunslingers do. And if they were to not do this, if they were to recognize the need, go through the ritual and then turn away because the tower is more important than these people and this town, they wouldn't be gunslingers anymore. They would be something else. And they, maybe they would be that beast that arrives at the tower, you know, and 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 we've been told that is worse than anything. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. Um, I, I do think it's really reassuring that even if we feel that Roland is really slipping in some regards, he's made a lot of mistakes uh, in these chapters, He at least he still thinks of himself as the kind of person whose job it is to defend the helpless. At least that's something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that is that is such a core tenet of what being a gunslinger is that I don't think that will ever go away yeah. from Roland. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's there's one more little little bit here where he says, are you all well, Eddie, Jake, a slight pause, Susanna? They all nodded. Oi nodded, too. Um, I don't have anything to say here, but Oi nodded. And that's great. Yeah. You know, it's funny because Oi is not comic relief. He's more just like just relief. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like every time Oi comes up, you're just like. Okay, well, at least at least Oi's still here. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's gonna be fine as long as Oi is still here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's he's served key roles in the past in these in this story for certain, but he he also doesn't pitch a fit every time there's there's mean Oi erasure, which is exactly what's happening. Here. Yeah, yeah. Why are you not worried about me, Roland? Yeah, I'm gonna nod anyway because yeah, I'm doing fine. You didn't ask, but I'm doing okay. I mean, King really does use him perfectly right like he does it, it, yeah. never never so much that it's a gimmick but but always just just there being being a solid billy bumbler yeah and i wanted to bring that up here because i think he kind of gets lost in what we're doing here because most of the time he's just like a one-off reference that makes you laugh or, or warms your heart and it, it doesn't get into our theming 
very often, um, at least not recently. So just I, I wanted to draw attention to Oi. We can't forget about this little guy. He's great. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, in, in the sense that I always love to analyze stories and think like, well, you know, what makes this work? I think I think elements like this that are so small that, that it's very easy to dismiss them as being meaningless or just like kind of cutesy and not really relevant. It's like, well, you take Oi out, it really changes the tone of a lot of things. Um, yeah. I mean, not just the fact that he's relevant to the plot in some places, but it, it, it makes everything just across the board a lot grimmer because you don't have this cute little fella who's, who's tagging along and just kind of yeah. reminding us like, these are the good guys. These are the guys who befriend and take care of this, this, uh, innocent animal. Yeah. I completely agree there. I love him. Yeah. Let's never forget about it. Let's not. So the Roland list trio enters Tuke's store and basically it spends the entire time there making him annoyed and uncomfortable. Then Susanna almost breaks off his thumb, but that's OK because he was like a racist asshole and, and we don't like this guy very much at all. He sucks. We don't like him. Yeah. Fool of um, a Tuke. <laughs> I like this quote, though, Matt. Too bad Detta Walker wasn't here to shoplift a few things from that son of a bitch. Don't think I wasn't tempted on her behalf, Susanna said. I might be misremembering. But I can't think of a lot of times in which Eddie has kind of directly referenced Detta Walker around Susanna. I wonder if it, her personalities are just kind of on his mind a lot lately with everything that's been going on. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's always funny to me how kind of good humored Susanna is about like being reminded of, of that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but also, I, I think, I mean, maybe it's just sort of Eddie casually mentioning that, but maybe on a certain level, he's also kind of testing, like just kind of yeah. wondering like, what is she going to say if I mention Detta? Uh, you know, is this going to provoke something? Is she going to behave in a, in a different way? I don't know. Yeah. I, I like that. And I think, I think, I think that's a fair read because I think we're seeing that from all of our characters. Like, I think, you know, we, we didn't talk about it, but when, Roland like looks around the circle and asks everyone if they're well there is a slight pause before he says Susanna mm -hmm. right as if he's like gearing up for doing this so our right. characters are like very subtly acting and reacting to Susanna in different ways yeah. because of the things they know I mean that slight pause is actually kind of sad because it's like it's telling you right there like he doesn't really think of her as part of the group in this moment yeah it is separated right it yeah it sucks yeah yeah wow I like that. I like that a lot. I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, it does literally. Are you all well, Eddie, Jake? Long pause, <laughs> Susanna. Yeah. Like as almost she's she's a different thought. Right. From the oh, all. yeah. You're not included in all. Yeah. 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 I have to have to be sure that she thinks she's included, even though she's not. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I love that. Um, so, so after they finish their shopping, they just kind of hang out on the porch and a crowd builds to come chat with the gunslingers. And this week on my weekly series called I fucking love Eddie is this little bit here. Folks coming. Jake said, I think they want to talk to us. Sure they do. Eddie said, it's what we're here for. He smiled, his handsome face growing handsomer still under his breath. He said, meet the gunslingers folks. Come, come Kamala shooting's going to follow. <laughs> Uh, I love Eddie. I love him. Like I, Stephen King is so clever. Like to write a clever, funny character like this, you have to be clever and funny. And I, like he's always great. Yeah, well, he always has the best thing to say. Clever and funny in a in a specific sort of snarky, snark ass yeah, way that I yeah. really appreciate. I love snark. Snark is great. Snark is underrated. Yeah, like sarcasm, but not just sarc. Like not just. Sarcasm can be very cheap if you, you know, you're just like, yeah, you know, yeah, right. Like that's sarcasm. But like, like Eddie always goes for just like these hilarious, uh, uh, riffs on, on whatever. Yeah. And it's always great. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's, it's really great. And so they basically spend the rest of, of their morning just schmoozing with the locals. Um, we don't really get to see it happen, but we see the aftermath of it, which is them exhausted. Uh-huh. But first, we have to cut over to Roland meeting with Henchek, Henchik of the Manny. And there's a lot. There's a lot in this conversation, Matt. I, I want to focus on a couple things in particular here. Roland is talking about Margaret to him and, and how she used to be a Manny, but is now what they call a forgetful, which is their name for someone who has left their tribe. And and we, we get this quote, and I think this is really interesting. I stayed with one of the forgetful last night, Roland said. We speak of the forgetful eye. Or isn't that what you call those who choose to leave thy Katet? We speak of the forgetful eye, Henshik said, watching him closely, but not of Katet. 
We know that word, but it is not our word, gunslinger. And I think this is really interesting, Matt, because like I said a couple weeks ago, we've heard of the Manny, you know, almost from the first book, but we really did not know very much about them. We know that they worship the man Jesus. Um, so we could like say they, they worship a kind of Christianity and we know that they travel between worlds, but they don't subscribe to Ka, Ka, Ka Tet. Those are not our words. And that's interesting, right? Yeah, sure. One thing that comes to mind is that, you know, one of our wonderful listeners a while back pointed out that words like Ka and, and Ka Tet have roots in ancient Egyptian mythology. And so maybe like that, that pagan stuff doesn't sit well with these kind of pseudo Christians. Um, and another thought I had, another possibility is like maybe they see Ka as being a real thing, but like a bad thing, like like a thing of the mm-hmm. devil rather than a thing mm-hmm. of of Christ. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah, I don't know which of these it is, but I can kind of see, I can kind of see why a group of Christians, pseudo Christians, whatever living in this world might not want to endorse this, this, uh, this word that has some kind of religious connotations to it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and it's like, it's confusing because like pseudo Christians is right because we know that they worship Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? Um, however, Callahan finds their religion and his religion distinct enough to where he doesn't like hang out with the Manny when he decides he wants to preach again. He he builds his own church and does his own thing entirely separate from them. Yeah. So don't we learn that Hinchick has like a whole bunch of wives? Yes. Yeah. So yes. like like quite a quite large differences in culture, actually. Yes. So the Manny are just Mormons. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um so then there is this matt the manny have have ways of knowing gunslinger always have will you not call me roland nay (laughs) um this is so fascinating right yeah um i mean i think my current theory has to be that the gunslinger religion i'm going to use that word that that whatever kind of ethos it is that the gunslingers live by that involves ka um, it's something that the many find offensive or disagreeable or maybe even evil. And so like Henshik is, is willing to talk to Roland, but he's going to keep him at arm's length. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I, I, my interpretation of this was like, I kind of maybe dove a little too far into this, but Hey, this is what we do. Right. Yep. Um, way back in the gunslinger, we talked about how Roland was the gunslinger first and Roland second. We were introduced to him as the gunslinger, and it wasn't until pages and pages later that we learned his name, Roland. And and, and you could argue that the book was in a certain way about him reclaiming his identity, reclaiming his name, stop being just the gunslinger and start becoming Roland DeShane, the person again. Um, and, and, And then, of course, he tosses that name kind of back into the pit when he lets Jake fall. But... I like this idea that in these moments in which Roland has kind of regressed to that previous person, Henchik is refusing to call him by his name, is only referring to him by what he is, the gunslinger, the, this impersonal title. Um, I, I don't know. I like that a lot. Yeah, I maybe we're saving the moment when Henchik is able to call him Roland for some future moment of, of meaningful change. Mm-hmm. But we don't even necessarily even have to do that. Yeah. Either, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I do like your your framing here, though. I, I admit mm-hmm. that I'm I I may be going uh, off, you know, galaxy brain in a certain direction with this whole like the Manny and Ka and gunslingers and, and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll see. We will. Um, next, Henshik takes Roland to the unfound door. We see, unsurprisingly, that this door in a cave is exactly like the doors on the beach, complete with its ability to disappear when you stand behind it. I just love, like, the the recurring beat in these books. I don't know why it's stuck out to me so much that every time a character finds these doors, the first thing he does is walk behind it and then see it disappear and then, like, test it back and forth multiple times. Like, even Roland, who this is, like, these doors are old hat to Roland now, still does it again, where he's like, uh, it's gone. Oh, uh, it's back. I don't know. Maybe if I was standing in front of a magical door that disappeared when I stood behind it, I'd, I'd do the same thing. But I, it, it's really just, it really just cracks me up that like King always draws attention to the fact that this is how people behave the first time they see these doors. It's hilarious. I agree. I, I noticed the same thing. He, he does the same test where he like 
finds the point at which it disappears. And on, on the one hand, you're like, okay, we're verifying this is the same exact exact kind of door. Like it's exactly mm-hmm. the same kind of door, um, which is valuable from a narrative point of view. But also, it's just it's. Um, I mean, I, I think I think you're right that if you ever did see such a thing, you would definitely just do this. <laughs> you would just <laughs> just walk around it like three or four times. Um, I mean, it would be really cool to just like see something pop into existence. Yeah. Like well, you just move your head a little bit and bam, it's sure. There. I don't know how often you've been around like holograms, like real legit holograms, but um, they're they're fun in exactly this way where you you walk past them and then you stop and then you kind of move and you move slightly in one direction and you try to find like the exact point in space at which the hologram pops into view. Um, that's how I think of this. I, I kind of always think of the doors as being like holograms actually. Do you like hang out around a lot of real legit holograms? Uh, like I think I've been to like a couple of museums where it was like one of the main things about the museum was that they had a whole bunch of holograms. Okay. Um, it's funny because some people like 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 real holograms are actually pretty rare. We see a lot of like fake shitty holograms all the time, but mm-hmm. real holograms are, are pretty cool. Um, now, what is what is a real hologram? We don't have time to talk a, about this. I mean, a real hologram <laughs> is is like a shockingly three dimensional looking thing that's like appears to be popping out of a of a glass pane. Um, maybe you've never seen a real hologram, and then I don't know if I have. I need to I've, take I've you seen... to a hologram museum. <laughs> There's hologram museums? My mind is being blown here. <laughs> you know what? We'll figure it out. We'll talk we'll, we'll, a, we'll sort this out. We'll talk about it next week, okay? Folks, there's a whole museum for holograms. What year are we living in? Uh, um okay, so <laughs> I, we see on this door is written the word unfound. It's in those weird hieroglyphs again, but they can for some reason read it. And I want to talk about that word a little bit here because we didn't spend much time on this last week, but, but the door being called the unfound door is so delicious to me, right? Because in that Thomas Wolf book, um, I forget the name of it now, but, but in that, in that book, in context of, of what we were talking about there, the unfound, unfound door there was the way into heaven, basically. There, there, everyone is a prisoner on this earth, and we're all looking for our way into heaven, our way into goodness, our way into freedom from this prison that is existence. But by calling it an unfound door, you are basically saying that we're never going to find it right that 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 this 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 happiness this thing we're searching for we will never find because it is it is literally unfound um so it kind of it kind of hints that there is no path forward and yet here it is found the unfound door has been found it's standing right in front of our 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 characters yeah i I love that i mean the, the the poem is super fun to think about um I wanted to to at least for a second talk about the extremely literal interpretation, which is that um, if you imagine all the doors that we found in the story as like having the metaphysical name of the person who comes through them written mm-hmm. upon them, we've got the prisoner. He's he's the prisoner. Lady of Shadows, it's the Lady of Shadows. The boy, that was Jake's door, and mm-hmm. now the Unfound, um, which I guess could just be the title of. Callahan, the person who came through the door. So is Callahan unfound? I mean, I think maybe he is. He he's lost. He's a wanderer. He's a searcher. Um, he's he was literally unfound in the sense that Roland didn't find the door. That they just kind of Callahan came out of the door and he he stumbled across him much later. Um, sure. So there's there's a few senses in which you could say Callahan's you know themes of being of his character have to do with searching and finding and things being being unfound so um yeah so callahan being the unfound actually makes some sense to me yeah no i like that i like that a lot I, it doesn't say the unfound it just says right? unfound i think yeah yeah it's, it's kings being tricksy yeah i mean i i don't i'm not certain about that right um sure but uh but you know he he's the one who came through the door so yeah so while roland is here there's like this spooky ledge in this room this like this drop and from the darkness beyond the door 
we hear voices. Like I think this cave used to be called like the ca- the cave of voices before the door was here, and then it changed. Then its name changed. But he hears voices from his past call out to him from this dark gloom. He hears his father. He hears Walter Martin, whatever. Um, he hears he hears the horn of Eld blowing, and and the the final charge on on um on uh, uh Jericho Hill. And he hears his mother. And I think this is interesting, Matt, here, because here's what his mother says. Here's the voice he says. Roland, don't! His dead mother shrieked up from the darkness. Don't shoot! It's me! It's your... M-. But before she could finish, the overlapping crash of pistol shots silenced her. So we can kind of speculate and wonder here, right? Um, when we saw Roland's memory of killing his mother, she did not say these words, right? She right. did not say, don't shoot, it's me, it's your mother. She did not say them. Correct. Um, so this could be just whatever darkness lies beyond this door, taking his past and manipulating it to punish him. So where he's imagining that this is what happened. But I also like the idea that maybe, maybe she did say that. Maybe she did actually say that. And he had just forgotten it or it was not shown to him. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think my assumption was the, the former that, that the, the, the evil darkness here is just just says things to mess with you um or or, you know if this is her ghost maybe her ghost is is you know reliving the moment of her death and is is able to say things that she never actually said um i will say the quote we hear from his father is just a direct mm -hmm. quote of what his father said to him yeah yeah i mean i i I do i do enjoy your idea that maybe he's blocked out the idea that the the fact that she uh she uh tried to speak to him um which would just make it even worse (laughs) <laughs> yes it would maybe i'm just i'm just wanting to see my poor roland suffer and so i'm inventing reasons for why you're just so mad at him this week <laughs> i love roland we're just disappointed roland yeah we're just really disappointed um so we learned that the manny found out about the door and about callahan who came through it thanks to some sort of machine they found in another cave um a machine that played a message for them uh, as we'll learn later, a tape recorder mm-hmm. that was left for them, telling them to come here. And Roland immediately assumes that this must come from the man in black, which I think we we don't get told that explicitly, but it seems like that that is the case, right? Um, it does seem like that's the case. It it <laughs> presents all sorts of questions about how how busy the man in black must be to be like uh, appearing briefly in the way station, and then many years. <laughs> earlier question mark have <laughs> appearing in in the cave to leave a tape recorder i don't i don't know um i mean maybe he can time travel i don't know uh, perhaps yeah no who knows it's fun times though uh-huh. it's pretty wild um and then we kind of finish up the chapter when they start talking about the blackness um because they they basically find out that the the Black 13 controls the door, it seems. So when you open the case, the Black 13 is in, the door opens. When you shut the case, the door shuts. And they see, uh, uh, when they look into this door and when they look into this case that holds this this glass, they see blackness and then they see red. Um, and, And the line here are, I think so, Roland said, the blackness you saw is cast by Black 13. The red might have been the eye of the Crimson King. Who is he? I don't know, Roland said, only that he bides far east of here, in Thunderclap or beyond it. I believe he may be a guardian of the Dark Tower. He may even think he owns it. At Roland's mention of the tower, the old man covered his eyes with both hands, a gesture of deep religious dread. Oh, lots to talk about, Matt. Yeah, Uh, I mean, the first thing that pops in my mind's eye is the idea that you've got the, the red eye peering out from the globe, which is just the most direct visual image from Lord of the Rings that i can think of um yeah i mean i didn't i didn't type that in the notes because i just assumed right. that you were going to make that connection yeah. but yes. I, mean, I mean it's almost too uh, obvious to belabor <laughs> <laughs> but yes um sure but it is a more direct mention of the crimson king than we usually see like roland says yeah crimson king he's a dude he lives in the east he's, mm-hmm. he's associated with the tower i mean we i guess we sort of knew that roland knew this but i don't know if we've ever heard roland say as much yeah, I mean, I mean, look, like, I believe he may be a guardian, capital G guardian mm-hmm. of the Dark Tower, right? So, like, a, a formal title like the guardians that we've seen. We've seen the guardians of the beams. He's saying that the Crimson King, who is the bad guy, <laughs> might be a guardian of the tower. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
It's fascinating. It is. It is. It is also fascinating to me that the, this is another thing that the Manny are not aware of. Right. Um, the Manny have no idea, have never heard of this name have no idea who this, these people who journey and travel through the infinite universe. That is the levels of the tower have no idea who the Crimson King is. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting what they do and do not know. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, and Roland does know about it. Um, yeah. I mean, like I go back to the very first book where, where, um, we're listening to a, a sermon in the, the church in Tull and, they're talking about the crimson king Mm -hmm. that like that that is what uh sylvia pittston talks about that that the child in her belly will be a child of the crimson king yeah um right so so she knows about about him it's interesting because i wonder if there's like an implication of like the child if it was born would it have been like a like a like a vampire or like like a low man or like some kind i mean i know i'm being extremely like nerdy and literal here (laughs) <laughs> um, but like, I wonder, I wonder what, what does it mean to be a child of the Crimson King? But yeah, no, that, 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 that's true. I mean, I think, I think Roland has been tangling with agents of the Crimson King probably since before this story started. I mean, I mean, no, for, for sure. Right. Because the, uh, the Crimson, uh, I forget, uh, man, I forget whether he, he, he knows that the Crimson King is backing the dude who is, um, you know, rebelling. I guess he does know because the ball tells him that the Crimson King is the one behind, um, you know, the good man, Farson. Oh, Farson, yeah. Farson. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's, yeah, I think like they carry the sigil of the Crimson King. I think he's pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, everything, everything in the story that we hear in that book, Roland knows, right? So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, all right. So let's move on to chapter nine. The priest's tale concluded parenthetical unfound uh which i think once again matt supports your your (laughs) connection to callahan specifically so after a morning of schmoozing with the locals eddie Susanna, jake and oi return to callahan's church to catch a quick nap before roland returns and callahan finishes his story jake and oi pass out immediately but eddie and Susanna talk a bit eddie decides to tell Susanna about what he learned from grandpair because he still hasn't told anyone uh, but she stops him. She says, no, I don't want to hear it. She said at once. He raised his eyebrow, surprised, although he supposed he'd known we could get into this, she said, but I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. Tell Roland what the old guy told you and tell Jake if you want to. But don't tell me not yet. So by the end of this chapter, it will be revealed that Susanna knows or suspects more about what's happening to her than she has let anyone else know about. And I think this at the beginning of this chapter kind of sets our stage for that a little bit, right? That that Susanna is aware of something and therefore says, no, don't tell me. I Like something's going on with me. I don't want to know these things, uh, whether that she thinks that will be dangerous for them. We don't know. But uh, it is it is her kind of, I think, showing her hand a little bit that she knows something's going on with her. Yeah. I think in this moment, I assumed that this is one of those times when her mind kind of fabricates a plausible reason why she shouldn't or should do a thing. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, but the real reason of course is like, if I learn this information, then the jig will be up. So therefore I can't learn the information. Um, but, but then I thought about that and I couldn't square it with any reasonable guesses about what the wolves would look like. So I just kind of let it go. And in retrospect, I think you're likely to be right that she doesn't trust herself and, and is actually being, you know, good here. Um, that, like this isn't a, a ploy. This is her being like, you probably shouldn't trust me right now. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, it's still really, really interesting. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Um, and we get this really great moment that I just wanted to touch on briefly. Uh, it says a rectangle of light moved steadily up their bodies as the sun sank. It had moved back into the true West, at least for the time being. Uh, this is just King kind of just not so subtly reminding us that this world is weird and changing constantly and things are not the way they should be. Yeah. The, the true West is such a, yeah. uh, such a, such a funny term, um, in light of so many of our confused conversations about this, or I guess my confusion and you were laughing at me. Um, but sure. But sure. yes, I wonder if we can get a little metaphorical or symbolic with that, that, that perhaps in this moment, as these characters are napping after a day of, of schmoozing, um, things are temporarily 
okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Like Eddie and Susanna are okay. Like there's this temporary, like things have aligned correctly for just a little bit for our characters. Yeah. um, I I like that a lot. I, I, does that mean that, that things will get better from now on? I don't know. You know, I I don't know. I want to believe that. Yeah. I mean, I do think, I do think Susanna coming clean at the end of this episode gives you hope for that. Right. That like, we our characters have shown that they are unable to communicate effectively with her and force her to kind of do it to him to them yeah. and but that is a positive development yeah. she tells them hopefully. and roland feels ashamed about it and mm-hmm. but but we don't know what comes after that i mean at this point like i really want to believe that they have their palaver that they need to have and put all the cards on the table but i'm i'm not feeling very hopeful right now like just my feeling about the direction of the story yeah like like is she, is she says i mean she basically ends the thing let's we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. when we get there yeah yeah so roland returns to callahan's as well but he doesn't take a nap instead he well rosalita takes him back to her place and rubs some oil on his aching legs and his penis uh-huh. uh outside of of the story of susan Roland has not taken a lover in this book, in these these stories, since Tull, right? Not that there's been a lot of opportunities to do so on, on the quest so far, but it's a rare enough occurrence that, that Roland is shacking up with someone that I think its, it's uh, inclusion here feels significant to me. Yeah, and, and I, I don't mean to immediately spin things in a negative way, although that does seem <laughs> to be what we're doing this week. Um, but it, it seems to me like Roland only really looks for sex when he's in need of a distraction, um hmm. again there's a real paucity of data points here but it just seems like under normal circumstances roland is just too mission focused to for like for this to be on his radar at all and in, in a time like this where he's already kind of like ashamed of himself and looking for like an escape uh this is the situation where roland looks for physical sure. comfort yeah yeah i like that i like that especially in a story where sex is so Char- it has a, such a charged meaning yeah. right this is it, the the allusion to sex and the good and ill of it have, yeah. have been referenced so many right times. i mean yeah. i mean the only time when sex is not kind of weird and and bad is like eddie and Suze, Su- susanna who clearly are just like deeply in in the most profound love imaginable um and yeah. i don't think you could characterize roland's relationship with rosalita that way so uh <laughs> no, no i do not think so um so callahan finally returns and after they all eat a nice meal he resumes his story he tells of how he got to new york and went to visit his old friend rowan at the hospital and this this is where he finds rowan's twin sister rowena it's uh it's a lot of 19 shit going on yeah. here, Matt. Super 19. Um, it's funny. The book doesn't even point it out. The, the, book, the yeah. book doesn't draw your attention to Rowan and Rowena. It's just kind of there for you to be like, wait, wait, Rowena? Really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's almost as if everything's paying off here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and we meet Rowena and she's pissed. She's furious. I, I, I love her anger here, Matt. She's she's mad at having her brother taken from her. She's, she's furious that the wolves of New York came for them. And she's furious at the people who she holds responsible for ripping him away from the life he should have had. Like, like maybe in, in some way she's furious at Ka, but she doesn't have a name for it. Furious that, that this novel, the story came bowling over her brother's life. Um, and, and that is kind of true because we'll learn that Rowan was attacked by the Hitler brothers, but they weren't looking for him. They were looking for Callahan. Mm-hmm. Um, they were hired by the low men to do so. And uh, so so from a certain point of view, it's kind of all Callahan's fault that that Rowan is here, right? I suppose so. I mean, I, I have a hard time holding him against him because the reason why they're after him is because he's a wandering vampire slayer. But I mean, I guess, yes, in a sense, it is his fault. Yeah, I mean, especially to 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 Rowena, right? Yeah, to, to this this woman who looks at her brother's life and 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 it, it's so funny because she kind of overplays it a little bit. She kind of um, says like he wrote a novel and he would have been a famous novelist and it was so good and he could have, but he got sucked in with with Alcoholics Anonymous and with you folks, you type of people that his friends and King emphasizes friends like like never had callahan heard someone use a word so good in such a negative way yeah. um it's it's really wonderful and of course there is yes like 
we are invited to make this comparison to the people back in the Kala, this people that, that, that every one of these twins, every one of these people, um, whose, whose twin is stolen from them, whose life is stolen from them, um, have to sit here and, and be angry about it. And they, they can't take out their anger on the people that are doing it because they're the scary wolves. So they, they, they feel powerless and they don't know what to do. And, and I love that Rowan isn't dead in this moment yet. So it's like he's kind of just an empty shell, just like yeah. the root ones yeah. are. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do. I do really love that moment. It's it strikes me as a very Stephen King moment where she leaves the room and then Rowan, it, it like is like she's she's kind of exaggerating my accomplishments. You know. <laughs> yeah, my book my book was actually kind of yeah. bad. Actually, <laughs> it's just that I mean, just like the the idea that that guy would would feel compelled to clear that up in this moment just struck me as mm-hmm. a, as first of all very realistic sort of like character touch, but also just like yeah. oh, this is a this is a Stephen King thing. Um, sure, that, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. so good. Um, so Callahan, after being told that the low men were actually looking for him, recognizes that he needs to leave, leave town and leave town immediately. But he just before he goes, he has to check back in on home one last time. And he's got to walk past that vacant lot on 2nd and 46th Street. Um, and, and right as he gets to that vacant lot, which in 1981, we're told, has a very high fence around it, which is different from the last time we saw it. And remember, this would be after the crisis with Calvin tower, right? This would be four years later, chronologically, I believe. I think so. Yes. Time travel. Yeah, I think that's, um, that sounds right to me. Yeah. So this is after, after everything with Calvin tower. Um, but he, so it has a very, very tall fence around it that you can't just hop over anymore. But as he's here, as he's walking by this place, he is jumped by the Hitler brothers, which he names Lenny and George from of mice and men. Um, and it's a perfect description of these guys because they're kind of they're kind of knuckleheads. Yeah. Um, and this is so this is what's fascinating to me. So Lenny then grabs and squeezes Callahan's balls. And Matt, this is another Kingism um, to tie into King's use of, of sexual imagery and violence. He has characters like hurt balls a lot. <laughs> uh it's funny. I, 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 like, I don't know how I would grab the balls of a man who is standing in front of me. It sounds difficult to do, but I'm sure that well, I'm sure Stephen King knows exactly how this would go. So I'm, I hope that you don't have a lot of real world experience in that. I mean, I just feel like, like, how would you do that? You know, you just you just grab them. You just grab just get a handful of scrote and squeeze. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I actually just finished reading Rose Matter the other day on my my constant King reread. Um, and Oh boy, there's a lot of there's a lot of hurting of balls in that book. <laughs> I I I feel it. I feel it as I read. Uh, yeah, I love the um the the physical descriptions of like the the feelings in his you know his abdomen and his whole his whole body kind of reacting mm-hmm. because uh, that's exactly what it feels like to have your balls damaged and and um, yes, it does. King, King must have done some like experiments to figure this out. <laughs> no. He didn't He's just go that good of a writer, um, I think. I mean, I'm I think every man in existence has probably like had had their balls hit at some point in the like, right? Like it is, I, it like, is an unforgettable situation uh, s- s- uh, sensation, so. Yes. And I think he can take that and extrapolate what someone like consciously putting force on uh, them would, would I, feel I will like. tell you something about children is that they have an almost supernatural ability to nail you in the balls. <laughs> um just just all all the time so anyway that's uh i didn't think there was going to be quite this much much yeah, balls talk ball chat this, this week, week but yeah. yeah oh well so so i want to talk about george and lenny a little bit here matt or as we'll later learn their names are actually nort and bill and they're this this specific kind of king monster bully they're they're undoubtedly cruel and horrible horrible but they're also kind of played as these like knucklehead bebop and rock steady types that I think we've seen before. They're they're while they're doing these horrific things, they're arguing about dumb shit amongst themselves while Callahan sits on terrified, like like scrot and bolt, that's the same thing. Like like they're just like being dumb. And I it's a very specific kind of monstrous human being. Um 
he could have just made these guys unquestionably scary, like for like scary and intimidating the whole way through in the same way that he later makes like the low men scary, but he doesn't. Right. This is not so much like the banality of evil, but like the idiocy of it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of our fun discussion question from a few weeks back where some astute readers pointed out that uh, King uses a few different types of evil with one mm-hmm. type being something like this, like cosmic ultimate malevolence. And then one type being like common, ignorant, stupid bullying. And these guys are definitely the latter. Yeah. And I think it, it's interesting because it, it doesn't make them scary, but it, it makes them human. And that makes them almost like more disturbing, right? Yeah. Because you can see their humanity. Like they're, th- these are two brothers that just kind of joke amongst each other and, and they're kind of dumb and they, they get like, they get their asses kicked here. Um, but they also have killed many people. Um, and they almost killed, um, Callahan here and they killed Rowan and they're, they're horrible, horrible people, yeah. but they're also silly yeah. and like hench, like the, the dumb, the dumb hench people. Like it's, it's so interesting. I really like it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that's, that's the thing is like common, ignorant, stupid bullying is common. It's, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I, I, I mean, I think in this story, at least it's the, the cosmic evil uses the, the common evil as a tool um sure sure even though it's a kind of a shitty tool like like evidently it doesn't work here um hmm. but i guess maybe that doesn't matter if there's so much of it yeah yeah uh so the two drag callahan into the turtle bay washateria and this is and callahan notices turtle bay washateria you wash or we wash either way it all comes clean and of course, clean in this instance is spelled K L E E N, which I guess is supposed to be like a brand, um, like a brand of something. I don't know. It, it's very fat. It, it really jumped out at me here. Yeah, I don't know. It's, of course, the turtle. We know about the turtle. But I, now I feel like the, the turtle graffiti was always slightly misspelled. I mean, maybe this is a hint as to something that like something else, like that maybe somebody named clean is going to show up at some point. Maybe. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. It all comes clean. I like this turtle. He, he's he's a good guy. Good turtle. Uh, you know, on his back, he holds the, the earth. I heard, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. So Lenny slash Bill begins to carve the swastika into poor Callahan's head. He first makes a cross, and then they're interrupted by the cavalry, um, and they don't get to finish. And, and I want to talk about this for a, a bit, Matt, because the cross being carved into Callahan's head is such a loaded, fascinating choice. This could have been a swastika, right? This was, this was a few swipes away from being a swastika. And if it, if it had been finished, it would have resulted in Callahan's death. Instead, he gets the sign of the cross, kind of the sign of his past life, his past failings as a priest carved into his head. And he'll later refer to this as the Mark of Cain, which is a really fun biblical illusion, Matt, that I want to talk to you a bit here, because most people know the story of Cain and Abel, right? This is the first murder. Um, But we don't talk about what happens after Cain murders Abel very much, because because we see that Cain is kind of cursed by God. Genesis 411 says the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So God basically like banishes Cain and says like, like you can't, stay in any one place because you can't grow any food. You're also banished from my presence. So you're no longer in the presence of God, which is like it's in the biblical sense, worse than, than not being able to grow food. Um, but then Cain is like, Hey God, um, if you do this to me, like I'm like, people are going to just see me and they're just going to kill me immediately. And God is like, nah, uh, (laughs) He said, but the Lord said to him, not so anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Um, and so this is what the mark of Cain is. And, and there there is, you know, biblical theorists that debate 
whether or not God literally put like a physical mark onto Cain that like, like denoted this or whether this was just like he marked him in such a way that like metaphysically that all who saw him would know that that the punishment for killing this person is going to be so severe that no one would ever do so. Um, and this is really interesting, right? Yeah, uh, this is really fascinating in context of of who Callahan is. Uh, but Scott, movies have assured me that the mark of Cain was just 666, um, <laughs> which adds up to almost 19. Um, but not but quite. Not quite. 19. Uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I sort of wonder if getting marked with a cross isn't like, not just like symbolic, but also like practical in that it might like interact with his status as vampire hunter who has been physically rejected from a church. Like I, I, it's m- magical woo stuff maybe but um that that was one of the thoughts that i had but i mean yeah obviously the idea that callahan's been walking around with with a with a cross carved into his head um yeah is a is a really <laughs> uh, uh overt symbol of of what we're doing with this character i think yeah but i mean it, it's so fascinating to see in his interpretation uh, the mark of Jesus, the mark of God, the mark of Christianity is to him a mark of God's. It's not even God's punishment, because like the the mark of Cain is God saying, you may not kill this man. And so not only will he be cursed to wander, but he doesn't get to look forward to the sweet release of death because, you know, back back then, like people lived fucking forever. Right. right? Like it was like it was like hundreds of years people lived. Um, and so that's Callahan, right? Like he's, he's forced to wander the earth. Um, and, and for some reason he keeps not dying, right? Like he's saved here. He's saved from these people, um, magically and he's constantly saved and he's cursed to wander. And it's, it's so fascinating. I love it. It's it's simple as work. It's, it's doing so many different things. Yeah. And I just, I love right. well, it. It's, it's like he sees it as the mark of Cain because he hates his life. Right. And, right, right. but that's his choice in a certain sense. Like, like sure. it's his choice to reject the gift of life. I mean, I, I think we'll talk about this in a, in, in a little bit when he hits bottom. Um, but, but the idea, the idea that the mark that accompanied his salvation, his literal salvation would be the mark of Cain just speaks to his worldview at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the mark, the mark of his, the mark of his Lord yeah. <laughs> is the mark of damnation yeah. in his mind. At, yeah. yeah. At this point at least, but yeah. 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 So Callahan's saviors scare the bad guys away. They refuse to identify themselves and we'll talk about who uh, the quartet thinks they're, they are later in the chapter, but uh, they tend tell him to wait for an ambulance. And here he, th- he's thinking of the Elton John song that he's, re- that's been repeated in his head so many times that, that actually we'll learn he'll hear a tape of the recorder that led the Manny to the unfound door also has the Elton John song. Somebody saved my life tonight. Uh, this is we kind of glossed over this the first time, and I actually kind of want to circle back around to it because I think this is a really good time to talk about this song. Like the first time we hear it in this book, it's the story of Lupe being bit by the vampire that Callahan eventually kills. Right. This is his first vampire that he kills. Um, and, and the song plays in a little bit of an ironic state here because Callahan kills the vampire. He does not save Lupe. Um, so he doesn't save Lupe's life. But. Perhaps this event ends up saving Callahan's life. Like if we look at the meaning of this song, this song, this Elton John song is is autobiographical. It is about Elton John at the beginning of his career. He's engaged to this woman uh, that he doesn't love. He's in this miserable relationship. He's thinking about suicide. And it's a song about how one of his really close friends talks him out of this relationship, gives him the strength and encouragement he needs to focus on his music and to break free from this relationship that's bringing him down and, and leads to him becoming fucking Elton John. Yeah. Um, and in that context, this becomes really fascinating because this event defines Callahan. This event sets him on his purpose like at the time he was working at home he was trying to get sober um and he was he was starting to live this calm life working at this place but that is not callahan's destiny that is not callahan's fate he's has more important things to do and this interaction with lupe saves quote unquote saves him um and sends him on 
a path sends him towards his true purpose, which is to be the Elton John of Calibrin Sturgis's church. Yeah. Well, I, I think that I think this is what this story is about. This story mm-hmm. is, is about um, a man choosing to save his own life. Like, like, I mean, think about it. Like the whole story is Callahan spending years wandering in this almost like fugue state. Sometimes it's just this, this entire lengthy multi-year saga of this mm-hmm. long, arduous, like essentially never-ending process of things happening where sometimes people step in to save Callahan's life. Um, sometimes f- like fate seems to intervene to save Callahan's life. Um, but it's all to this point that's going to come in a minute where he hits rock bottom and he finally decides to value his own life, to save his own life. And I think it's only, it, it's it, like that's, that's pretty close, you know, storytelling wise to the moment when the, you know, the vampires finally get him. Like, it's like he finally chose to save his own life. He finally chose to value his own life instead of having it need to be saved all the time. Um, and uh, finally chose to care about himself. And now and now the story is ready for him as the, the chosen hero to walk through the door and enter Roland's story. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I totally agree. It's 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 the way in which, you know, we have a lot of answers to this week's discussion question that is uh, the music that is used in these books, the pop culture references to the music. And and what I love about it is there's always a way to just read it on the very surface level, which is just literally like this song is playing while he's attempting to save someone's life. He's thinking about the song while he just had his life saved. That is a very surface level read, but there's always more going on underneath. And, and I think he thinks about these things very specifically. Mm-hmm. And the more we think about them, the more I love them. Yeah, me too. Uh, so we, like we said, we'll talk about Callahan saviors near the end of the chapter when we find out who, at least who our characters think they are. Um, but the point is that Callahan finds himself alive and beaten up and back in room 577, which adds up to 19, the very same room where Rowan died just a few hours ago. So just 19 all the way down. Mm-hmm. The next day, he heads out of New York City and drinks himself across America until he ends up in Topeka, Topeka, Kansas. Of course. Um, I I love this line here. This went on until I got to Topeka, late winter of 1982. That was where I hit my bottom. Do you folks know what it means to hit a bottom? There was a long pause, and then they nodded. Jake was thinking of Mrs. Avery's English class and his final essay. Susanna was recalling Oxford, Mississippi. Eddie, the beach by the Western Sea, leaning over the man who had become who would had become his din, meaning to cut his throat because Roland wouldn't let him go through one of those magical doors and score a little H. So no Roland there, huh? No Roland. Well, Roland hasn't hit bottom. No. Oh, you know, interesting. now that I think about it, it's almost obvious. Of course he hasn't. He hasn't even come close. Because he hasn't even come close to quitting his drug. Yeah. There's been no point where he was really close to quitting his drug and, and he would have to hit bottom, right? So he, he, he hasn't. Roland hasn't. I mean, he's had some <laughs> bad times. He's had some real bad times, but he hasn't, he hasn't hit bottom. So that's my, that's my assumption. I like it, Matt. I like it a All lot. Right. So while at his lowest point, Callahan realizes that two people risked their lives to save his, and he owes them for that, at least a little bit. So he gives himself one year to get sober, and for once in his life, he succeeds, right? He does it. Yeah. Like I said a second ago, the universe keeps saving Callahan's life until Callahan finally gets it through his head that he's going to need to save his own life. And then as soon as he makes that decision, it, it, you know, things, things work out for him for, well, for, yep. for at least a year until they, you know, go completely sideways. Yep. Um, <laughs> that's true. Callahan finds himself in Detroit working for the Lighthouse Shelter, a place very similar to home. He's sober, and he hasn't seen any vampires, low men, or creepy pet posters in a long time. He says because God has taken him back, at least on a trial basis, and the power of Barlow's bite has finally been canceled. He's wrong. Of course. And King makes that clear. Uh, The Lighthouse Shelter gets a note from the Sombra Corporation, which is a name we've seen before, saying they're going to donate a million dollars to his shelter. And he has to come to a meeting to accept the check. The date of the meeting, what will be the date of Donald Callahan's death, is December 19th, 1983, a Monday. The place of the meeting is 982 Michigan Avenue. 
that also adds up to 19. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a trap, of course, Matt. Uh, The room is filled with type three vampires, low men and a man named Richard Sayer of the Sombra Corporation. They are here not to kill Callahan, but to let the AIDS infested type three vampires infect him. This will, quote unquote, take him out of the game forever. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, it it fits into what we think, like what I think I understand about the story, which is like, I think they might even know that, that if they if they kill him, if they just kill him, then it, it he might escape, <laughs> as it were, mm-hmm. which is what happens. Um, so they're gonna give him a virus, which sort of is, is crippling and debilitating that he can't escape from. Um, and and that might take him out of the game in some other way. It's, it's interesting though, because like, I guess um, I guess I guess a slow lingering death is just a different thing from a sudden violent death, and we've only ever seen people go between worlds via sudden violent deaths. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so Callahan here doesn't hesitate. If he hesitates, everything's over. Um, and it says here that it's not the AIDS he's afraid of, but of letting them put their filthy lips on him in the first place to kiss him as the one was kissing Lupe Delgado in the alley. They don't get to win. Callahan says after all the way he's come, all, all the jobs, all the jail cells after finally getting sober, they don't get to win. And so he tosses himself out of the fucking window and into the way station. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly where jake ended up when he died and and i think it's really i think like we have to talk about that you know you and i just spent 10 minutes talking about the ways in which callahan has been saved and saved and saved and the ways in which he needed to learn to save himself and once again this delicious contradiction of imagery that the manner in which callahan saves himself saves his life is through death Right. Mm -hmm. Um, He escapes the plot of the bad guys by killing himself again, something in Christianity, in Catholicism specifically. um, It's a big it's a big no, no Uh doing that. That's big. No, no suicide. Bad. No, that's eternal damnation. Bad. Um, But uh, once again, King is taking the imagery, the cross as representative of the mark of Cain, suicide as representative of of freedom of from uh, of salvation. It's taking these these things that mean certain things and kind of turning them around a little bit here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's definitely having fun playing with Christian imagery. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. just the fact that we have the Manny in, in in the story, very close to this part of the story, I, I think indicates mm-hmm. that he's. Um, he's sort of almost reappropriating some of these symbols to mean whatever he wants them to mean for his story. Sure, sure. But who does he meet here in the way station, Matt? Why, it's the man in black. Yeah, our good friend. We haven't seen him in a while. No, Walter O'Dim here again. Despite the fact that Roland and Jake have already come through this way and are currently up ahead chasing after Walter, Uh he's... He's yeah, here. <laughs> well, he had to loop around and now he's going to have to get ahead of them somehow. Almost as if that whole thing was bullshit. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, so I think I basically figured as soon as he reached the way station, I was like, okay, so how close did he come to missing Roland? And of course, it's mm-hmm. a matter of like minutes or hours at most. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the real question I had after all of this is like, whose design is this? What What pulled him here? Like Walter was here to greet him. So... Walter knew he was coming here. Does that mean Walter had a hand in pulling him here? Um, or, you know, did the dark forces bring him here or did the white bring him here? And Walter just knew about it in advance. And and who put the door yeah. there? Right. Cause the door, I mean, <laughs> I mean, obviously the door wasn't there when Roland was there. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions. There's, there's a, there's just a shitload of questions. There are. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right, because like it seems like by throwing himself out of a window, which is what led him here, he foiled the plans of the bad guys. But then here's here's bad guy numero uno yeah. sitting here waiting for him like this is all part of the plan exactly. in the first. Yeah, place. exactly. Like this, this servant of the Crimson King with the red eye on his head is like, no, my plans um, I'm doing, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it really sounded like that. And, but then, yeah, then immediately <laughs> there's a man in black right there. It's like, yeah, yeah. An- another servant of the Exa- Crimson exactly. King. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, we 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 know it's not the same person as Sayer, but we do get the connection of the the red dot on his head. You have um, you have to wonder what exactly the Man in Black's whole thing is. I mean, there's this moment. Uh, I'll just let you read this next bit, and then we can talk about that. Actually, sure, sure, yeah. So here's this quote. Who are they? He asked the man in black talking about Roland and and Jake off in the distance. Folks, you'll almost certainly never meet the man in black, says dreamily. The hood shifts for a moment. Callahan can see the waxy blade of a nose and the curve of an eye, a small cup filled with dark fluid. They'll die under the mountains. If they don't die under the mountains, there are things in the Western Sea that will eat them alive. Dada chalk. He laughs again, but... But all at once, you don't sound completely sure of yourself, my friend, Callahan thinks. If all else fails, Walter says, this will kill them. He raised the box. Again, faintly, Callahan hears the unpleasant ripple of chimes. And who will bring them? it to them? Ka, of course. Yet even Ka needs a friend. A Ka may. A Kai may. That would be you. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm getting this, the feeling that uh, the man in black has read The Dark Tower um <laughs> but yeah but but again he doesn't he, he it's almost like it's almost like walter knows that he's gonna fail like it's really complicated here um i mean the whole like like the, the dot of chalk thing moment is funny to me because it's like it's like one of his pop culture references except it's about something in this book sure sure <laughs> um that hasn't happened yet at this point mm-hmm. i mean yeah maybe he's been to the western sea and he knows about the creatures but it's it, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe he just saw it in the ball. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting, right? Because he knows he seems to know what's going to happen, but he is also wrong. They'll die under the mountains. That's what he says. Mm-hmm. Wrong. If they don't die under the mountains, there are things in the West Sea that will eat them alive. Wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, if all else fails, my final, final backup plan is this. This will kill them and you will you will bring it to them and help them kill help them and we see a little bit here like i think we can move right on to this one right you'll live on your level of the tower long as i'm long after i'm bone dust on mind this i promise you fada for i've seen it in the glass say true and if they keep coming if they reach you in the place where you were going why in that unlikely case you'll aid them in every way you can and kill them by doing so it's a mind blower isn't it wouldn't you say it's a mind blower uh yeah i mean king's really pulling a king here uh yeah <laughs> it's, it, it's so like walter to just brag about this kind of thing as if he's so assured of victory that he can just like give the heroes the critical information um yeah, yeah. And, and and yet yet callahan thinks he's not entirely confident here so right um you know and the thing is like he's always fucking wrong like that that's mm-hmm. that's the thing that must be evident even to walter at this point like like i remember when he showed up um uh to like i i guess save the tiktok man or at least to kind of enlist him he he's like he's like all right this shit's gone on long enough we've got to stop them now and that didn't work either (laughs) because now tiktok's dead and they got past blaine and they got past the emerald city like what what, (laughs) what? (laughs) but at the same time we're told by roland that the the sandwiches and the snacks put out for them when they woke up from their moment in the Emerald city were put there yeah. by Randall flag, right. the man in yeah. black. I mean, the, like, yeah, I mean, at, at a certain, like, I, I, I do think that my theory that he actually does want Roland to get to the tower, but he wants him to be broken is, is pretty supported mm-hmm. by a lot of this stuff. Like he keeps saying he's trying to stop Roland, but then he keeps giving him friends and um and, and like like obviously he's creating bad situations for him but the fact that he's failed to kill him so many times just be, begins to be suspicious at a certain point well and i think the, the the interesting thing about flag uh walter martin whatever you want to call him um is he like you said he's wrong and he he just always like kind of defers to a higher power mm-hmm. like like he he thinks these things are going to happen and he, and he has confidence, maybe even forced confidence because he has doubts about these things, but he doesn't know, like he seems to know what's going to happen or he thinks he knows what's going to happen, but he's, he's fulfilling a role. Right. And that's, that's what this next quote says here. Um, he, uh, Callahan says, you're cruel. Walter's eyes widened. And for a moment he looks deeply hurt. 
This may be absurd, but Callahan is looking into the man's deep eyes and feels sure the emotion is nonetheless genuine, and that, and that surety robs him of any last hope that this all might be a dream or a final brilliant interval before true death. In dreams, his at least, the bad guys, the scary guys, never have complex emotions. And Walter says, I am what Ka and the king and the tower have made me. We all are. We're caught. So... Like, he's just like, I'm just a tool. And I'm, uh, why am I doing this? Because Ka, why am I doing this? Because this is this is what I was made to do. And so he comes off with like this this false sense of certainty that what he's doing will stop the bad guys or in his mind, the bad guys, Roland, his enemies. This will stop. This will work. Um, but he's just following the orders that he's been given. Yeah, this is particularly interesting to me um, because it seems to make Walter into even more of a mirror of Roland, like this, this creature mm -hmm. of Ka, this self-described puppet of Ka, just like Roland. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I guess we have a lot of, a lot of mirrors of Roland now. I, I don't know. I don't know if I've seen Walter as a mirror of Roland before, but I mean, uh, Walter is, is a wanderer just like Roland and just like, uh, uh, just, just like Callahan really. I mean, he he's the he he is on this quest. He's, his quest is different from Roland's, but it seems to be very much related to Roland's. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can view them as Ro having sort of a pair of entwined quests that are almost the same quest. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Roland is is cursed to travel to the tower, and and Walter is cursed to stop yeah. him. Right. Like that is. Yeah, and and they see both seem powerless in their ability to to stop any of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean this idea that especially like Walter slash flag slash whatever he 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 always seems so overtly evil that seeing seeing him look hurt in this moment really hints that there might be something else going on. Like the 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 kind of cackling evil persona that he puts on is something that he's ha had to put on in order to deal with what he feels to be, you know, the, the, the path that he's been trapped into. Yeah. Or, or he's just, he's just fulfilling the role yeah. that he has been given in this whole play. Yeah. It's, in, it's, it is in, like, this is the first moment that I can recall in the whole series where I felt like the story did anything at all to make Walter even a, a molecule, um, sy sympathetic or human. So I'm really latching yeah. onto this actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is, it is important. I mean, the, the text draws specific attention to it. This may be absurd, but Callahan is looking into the man's deep eyes and feels sure the emotion is nonetheless genuine. King wants you to know that that actually did hurt Walter, that, that being accused of cruelty hurt him. Yeah. And, and yeah, you're absolutely right that everything we've seen from this character before this moment would say the opposite of that he right. he enjoyed bringing um what's his name back to life and tull he enjoyed whispering or, or planting the seed of 19 in um i'm, I'm think i can't remember any names anymore because it's been so long uh, but yeah blank blanking on it too yeah uh, he he took it seemed like he took pleasure in that he took pleasure in in forcing uh roland to choose between catching him and letting Jake go. Um, at every one of these moments, it's, it seemed like he is genuinely enjoying these things, enjoying this cruelty. And then, yeah, here suddenly, no, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, before we move on from this, I just want to get in another wild theory that Walter is, is Roland. Okay. Tra tra Roland travels back in time and he's Walter. Okay. There you go. That's it. That's the theory. I love it. I love it. For your entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the audience is either laughing at you or going, holy shit. Yeah, one of those two. And that and that's, I'm I'm basically fine with either. So that's mm -hmm, that's yeah. why that's why I went there. Yeah. So then we get this quote here, Matt. I don't think you'll be able to kill him, Callahan said. Walter grimaces, that's Ka's business, not mine. Maybe not Ka either. Suppose he's above Ka. Walter recoils as if struck. I've blasphemed, Callahan thinks, and with this guy, I've an idea. Dia, that's no mean feat. No one is above Ka, false priest. The black man spits at him, and the room at the top of the tower is empty. I know it is. Um, ooh, it's it's ooh. great. I mean, we just saw kind of the first crack of emotion from him, and now this is like he's like really mad. Yeah, yeah. We've never really seen him. Like he's always kind of aloof 
and 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 acting like he he is you know playing around and here yeah. he's actually mad and um i love this exchange because callahan really should have no idea what that last phrase means the tower the, the seat at the top of the tower is empty um but he he instantly equates it to meaning there is no god or, or god yeah. has absented his seat or, or whatever and i mean I, and callahan like you know even as far as he's fallen in life he doesn't believe that and he he contradicts the man in black it's a really great moment yeah yeah it, it is it is great i love it and it's like it's it's not quite but it's almost a non sequitur like i think it helps us understand that that like in at least in walter's mind ka is the tower mm-hmm. in a way like the tower and ka are kind of the same thing or of the same thing because saying no one's above ka because the room at the top of the tower is empty there is no god in there there mm-hmm. is no power there's no power in there above the tower itself there's no thing ruling over the tower itself mm-hmm. um and yeah callahan says nah um yeah. and it's just like I, once again the, the 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 small things like the i know it is at the end of the sentence if he had just said and the room at the top of the tower is empty that shows confidence mm-hmm. but comma i know it is shows doubt right yeah it, 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 it introduces uncertainty in the statement because he's trying to back it up i don't it's not just a fact i know it's a fact and oh my god that's so perfect because once again walter is as much of a slave is as bound to the wheel of ka as roland is and and he has beliefs in that like it it seems very important to him that there is nothing above this he he is he is angry because he is bound to this wheel and if someone else isn't, if they have a choice, that destroys his whole worldview. Right. Like, ima- like, like imagine this guy learning that, you know, all, all the horrible things that he's done in his life were not because he had to, you know, and, and mm-hmm. if he has any shred of conscience, which that's debatable still, um, <laughs> then that would probably be horribly, you know, devastating to him. Again, I'm I'm sort of provisionally assuming there is some like, core of humanity in this guy who up to this point we really haven't seen um sure but uh yeah i mean you'd have to like what would would someone without humanity be hurt at an accusation of cruelty i don't know yeah i don't know maybe maybe <laughs> it depends sure yeah sure. yeah I, I don't i don't know i'm not sure um, one more final quote that I, this is going to be really quick. I just wanted to reference this uh, as Callahan is backing away towards the stable um, as as flag is kind of pushing him towards the door. He he says, get away from me. And Walter says, nope, I can't go for that. No can do. Um, I can't go for that. No can do is the title of a, a Hall and Oates song. Um, <laughs> so like half of everything that walter says is a pop culture reference constantly (laughs) and like we've talked about before many of the time it's not for anyone's benefit but himself and us yeah there i mean this song was out when callahan i think the song came out in 1981 so it existed in in a timeline so there's a chance he actually did get this reference but there's a chance he also didn't at all (laughs) and it's not like man in black ever really cares because he does this in front of roland all the time yep yep so Walter pushes Callahan through the unfound door with the unfound box with Black 13 inside. And of course, we know exactly where he ends up in Caliber and Sturgis forced to wait in case Roland and his quartet show up, which, of course, they do. Um, and there's also one more brief thing here as, as he wraps up his story. He, he tells the quartet that he did go toe dash twice more. The first time um, he went to the funeral of his original tet mate, Ben Mears, uh, who is one of the characters in Salem's Lot. So he went to his funeral and saw the boy um, that he protected at the end of that book. And then he goes to the castle of the king, which we are told is a story for another time. Mm-hmm. The first one strikes me as almost a way for King to tie up a loose end or to give a satisfying little moment of, of catharsis for Salem's Lot readers. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, the yeah. second one is a, a teaser for what's to come. Yeah, I mean, I think the first one also to me allows callahan to see like 
his his moment of failure, right, is his moment when his faith failed him and he lost to Barlow. He his faith failed, his belief in God failed him, or or he did not have enough belief um that that he was defeated by this vampire. Mm. Um and he this is his great shame that cursed him and forced him to wander the earth. And he's toad ashes to the funeral of one of his old tetmates, Ben Mears, and sees the child that he saved failed or not def- like uh, defeated by Barlow or not his presence in that house at that time saved this boy's life. Right. Mm-hmm. He saved him and that's worth something. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it It's a positive thing. I mean, you know, I'm mm-hmm. almost surprised that black 13 would have given him this. Right. Yeah. I mean, if we're yeah. assuming it's this evil thing, it's uh, it, it gave him and you know, I, I'm I'm just imagining like, the readers of Salem's Lot would feel a, a pang of, of some kind of satisfaction seeing like, oh, you know, the boy yeah, lived and, and, and then and turns out that, that Father Callahan was actually there. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't know it, but he was actually there because of the because of the, the orb. Um, yep. He's all grown up. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Um, that, and that's not a thing that, that I would have expected Black 13 to do. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, we have to. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. All right, so this is the end of Callahan's story, and I want to talk about this story for a while because King, once again, has devoted hundreds of pages to his book to someone telling a story about the past, right? Like, literally, the entirety of Wizard and Glass was this, and now in this next book, we're doing it again. So what is the story? Is it just because he loves to dive in, do deep dives into these characters and it's fun, Matt? Yes, undoubtedly. But... It's more important than that, and I want to get into this with you. So what do you think? Well, most of all, I think that we that we needed to explore this facet of who Roland is mm. because this story is full of these little moments where Roland is just listening, and he goes like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can see the recognition. You can see this like deep understanding and, and resonance between Father Callahan's story and Roland's character as, as he's listening to this. I think mm-hmm. my favorite is when Callahan mentions that Black 13 shows you opportunities to change the past and implies that you can make things all the way better, not just a little better, but all the way better. And that, you know, to succumb to that kind of obviously arrogant folly, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is bad because you should, you should live your life in a humble way and, 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 you know, maybe build a church and, and take care of your, your parishioners, but don't try mm-hmm. to, to go off and pre- pre- prevent the JFK assassination because <laughs> it's folly. It's obvious folly. It's, it's grandiose. And Roland goes, Ahem. yes, Roland said. His voice was as dry as the snap of a twig in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately, as soon as, as soon as Callahan said that and then Roland responded that way, I immediately thought about Roland's quest. Th- this is Roland's quest. Go to the Dark Tower. Take the seat at the top of the Dark Tower, the pinnacle of all of existence. Save the universe in one fell swoop. Doesn't matter how many kids you have to let fall into abysses to get there. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's exactly this thing that Callahan is saying is arrogant folly. And um, this seemed really critical to me, especially, like, this was maybe one of the last things that, 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 that they talk about in this chapter, so it stuck in my mind um but this yeah. is my this is my thesis for what is this story for i mean it, this does a lot of stuff but that, that's what stuck out to me no i love that and I, and I think the thing i wanted to focus on is is if you take a step back and look at this story from like a higher level view how much it lines up with roland's life right callahan was this man who was part of a cotet he was part of this group of people that that were working together and at the end of that book he uh broke off he lost them and was forced to wander out on his own for a long long time um he met up with some people along the way and they ended up dead everyone that seems around him ends up dead um and then he he finally gets his shit together he finally finds a way to save himself and that leads him into another story with another cotet with another group of people and he ha- he's he's afforded another chance another choice another way of of finding meaning and purpose um to help these people to, to a, a new group to assist him um and that is very much that is very much a, a roland type story right yeah second chance the, the, mm-hmm. the idea of second chances and 
maybe third and fourth and fifth chances in some cases because I think they you, you could argue they both got a bunch of chances. Um, they both screwed up a lot and they both kept getting more and more chances. Actually, that's yeah, that, that's yeah. a commonality between the two stories. Yeah, and, and so uh, what remains to be seen is what Roland will take away from the story, right? What Roland will have learned from Callahan's experience. But I think I think you're spot on that. We, we have said this from the beginning that each and every one of these characters is representative of a, a facet of Roland Deschain. And we talked about the Wanderer at, at, when we met Callahan. And now here at the end of this story, we can absolutely see how this plays off of him, how this plays off his choices, the choices that he's made in the past and the choices that he continues to make the, 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 as we've labeled them, the errors that he is making right this minute, right this, this very minute. Um, and what that could mean, what that could do to him Mm -hmm. and the people he loves. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think second chances is something that hits especially hard when he is indeed making yet more mistakes right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so yeah. So the review I read that said, why we talk about this Callahan guy for 200 pages. That's why, that's why folks. Yeah. There you go. Review person. Mm -hmm. We know you're listening. Yeah, you're definitely listening to this story, a person who did not like book five of the Dark Tower. Um, so after Callahan leaves the Cotet, they, they wanted to talk amongst themselves for a while. Um, they all kind of like agree that the men who saved Callahan were probably Calvin Tower and, and Aaron Deep now. Um, that What do you think, Matt? I mean, I guessed it was them, you know, before. Uh, part, partly because of the way Tower kind of uses language and speaks um and then of course the ring which i was just like okay this is a book guy it's 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 tower it's him sure um, sure, sure but it, it is interesting because it implies that the, that tower and deep no have a lot more like agency in the story than i had assumed like they're they're more active they're not just like a couple of people who happen to sit in a bookstore all day uh, yeah and and i mean someone told them to be there yeah right yeah um, at that time and they, they did knew, it right <laughs> yeah yeah and they knew the names of the people that were going to be there yeah um yeah and they knew enough to know that they needed their identities hidden um yeah um i mean maybe maybe it's our quartet that told them that i mean i love the moment oh, we didn't talk about this i love the moment when uh 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 Callahan hasn't revealed yet who was there and 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 jake is like was it us? Was it us that came there? <laughs> it just like it's such a great moment because like I don't know if that occurred to me, but it's like such a perfect question for especially Jake to ask because like yeah, just popping in and out of time and space is such a normal thing for him at this point. Where it's like yeah, maybe yeah, that, that's something yeah. we're gonna do later, I guess maybe. I'm just fucking willing to believe anything at this point. Yeah, yeah like yeah. if you told me it was me, if you told me Oi, yeah. um, I was holding a gun and. <laughs> Shot this yeah. guy. I'd yeah. believe it. I had a I'd cyborg eye. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. Um, and yeah, it once again is like a teaser. It's, it's, it's teasing towards things that have not occurred yet. Yeah. Um, so they are about to break for the night when Susanna Dean speaks up and she says, I think I might have a little problem. I don't see how it can be, how it can possibly be. But boys, I think I might be a little bit in the family way. Having said that, Susanna Dean slash Odetta Holmes slash Detta Walker slash Mia, daughter of Nun, put her hands over her face and began to cry. Ah, I love that moment of of closure mm-hmm. and, you know, the implication that all of her facets share that moment. Like yeah, they're all yeah. they're all crying together. They're all they're all heartbroken. All of them feel the same about this. And, and and honestly, it, it makes you wonder, like, does this mean, is this a moment of healing for her? I don't know. I'm really curious to see where we go next with this, because um, if you take it literally, it could imply, like, Susanna has sort of struggled with and, and dealt with this on her own and maybe doesn't need the quartet to, like, intervene for her. I, I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I don't want to go too far into speculation land for something that's going to be revealed probably like really, really fast. So <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it just, it's exciting a little bit. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I love, I love cliffhanger moments like this where 
you're not exactly sure how you're supposed to react Mm -hmm. to it It, it, where you're like am i supposed to be happy about this because there's a part of me that goes oh thank god we're finally going to bring this out into the open um but then there's another part that's like okay how much does she know though Mm -hmm. because if it's just like all right folks i think i'm pregnant and then they have to be like okay but it's a demon though right um how's she gonna take that um well that's the and and i guess that's the thing is like she might take it terribly but they have to tell her (laughs) right right. (laughs) like like that the idea that she's not going to take it well should not and should never have been what was keeping them from telling her of course she's not going to take it well of course she's not (laughs) yeah you're you're you're, (laughs) when it comes to telling the truth how the person reacts to the truth being your primary reason for hiding it is uh wrong yeah yeah right i think i think man i really hope that we like what i hoped at the end of last week was they're gonna have a big conversation it's gonna be cathartic everybody's gonna feel better i get now i see now and and i feel now that actually we needed to kind of we kind of we needed to let callahan finish his story we needed to drag roland through the mud more so that he felt more ashamed and shitty about his choices and now maybe we can finally resolve that. We 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 yeah. still may not, but I feel like now it would be a lot more earned, and it would it would hit a lot harder. Yeah, the shame that Jake forced upon him was not enough to make him act immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but this shame, perhaps this shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. All right. Well, we are running extremely late, of course. So let's uh, let's wrap this up by talking about last week's discussion question. All right. Last week's question, Matt, is what is your favorite pop culture reference in The Dark Tower up until this point, at least? Um, lots of great answers once again. So let's go through them. Okay. Uh, so Jared369 says, uh, says one of the favorite things the king does throughout the works is reference himself because of this they say the the favorite pop culture reference is when he had his cast walk through part of the stand it's really great um i i have so much more to say about this in the future okay. but it's it's really wonderful okay. um puller 420 says my favorite pop culture reference is when king references himself <laughs> earlier in wolves when jake and eddie first go toe dash in new york and go to the manhattan restaurant of the mine and then they see the sign out front that reads from Maine chilled Stephen King. This always brings a smile to their face. Um, they say second has to be the Sneetches. Thank you for getting there, Matt. I was an early email discussion <laughs> with Scott. I remember that Puller 420. Yes. 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 All right. Uh, Dark Gazing says uh, the music nods. They say, I know King likes to write to music sometimes, and I find that I'm the same. Often I will, I find a track elicits a certain mood or emotion, and I try to capture that. My favorite in Dark Tower is probably Someone Saved My Life Tonight. They say they had not heard it until their third time through Kala and had to fire up YouTube to finally get the emotion and feel what King was going for with its inclusion. They say they listened to it over and over and it got them listening to Elton John. Um, okay. Cool. I um, don't know if I've actually gone out of my way to listen to that song, so I think I'm going to do that now uh, based on this. I basically was listening to it the entire time I was doing the Callahan story part of my prep work awesome, this week. Awesome. So it's a long song. It's like six and a half minutes long. Um, I, I, it, I like tool. What tool songs are like 15 minutes long. Anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. I was like Elton John and tool. What? How are those? The They're same? both great. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. Divide by hero says I'm going to have to go with Hey Jude being played in Tull because it really signals very early on. This is not the story you thought it would be. It's done so matter of factly too. King just mentions it in passing that someone is playing Hey Jude and then just moves on from the context. We get that it's a song that has a life of its own in Midworld, but we as readers are left wondering what the heck we just read. And it completely shifts our expectations of where this journey is actually headed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's uh, I will have fond memories of that first what moment uh for my entire life yeah i mean not having that in the story really really changes your stance toward toward the beginning of this whole series you you Mm -hmm. know if that weren't there just imagine how different it you would you wouldn't have these questions uh darian uh, sorry darian tyro says i lost it a bit the first time i heard what the wolves were wielding i can remember describing in detail to a friend of mine basically everything about this book and the wolves throwing deadly snitches and swinging around literal lightsabers was outright amazing to talk to him about 
he wasn't a constant reader, um, but he knows way more about the tower than he could possibly uh, than than he should because uh, because that's how obsessed they were in their youth. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> I remember being young and and the thing where you just like tell your friends the entire plot of a fantasy book and then they tell you uh -huh. the entire plot of a different fantasy book. I remember that. Yeah, I had a boss that would do that. I'd have like one on one meetings with my boss and we'd talk about work shit and then we'd finish that up and then we'd just start talking about stories we were reading and he would just explain the whole book to me uh -huh. for like 30 minutes. And I was like, this is cool. I'm not working. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a lot of those friends when I was in high uh -huh. school. I'm, it's an interesting psychological phenomenon. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, next up, we have Rob the Gob, who says, my favorite pop culture reference comes from the Wastelands. I'm not exactly sure of, of where it falls, but at some point, King rewrites the first paragraph of The Haunting of Hill House to describe the city of Ludd. The intro paragraph to Hill House is my favorite opening to any book, and it's awesome that King obviously shares the appreciation and love for that specific piece of writing. It also works very well for what King wants to do as it sets up Ludd to be a dark and disturbing place. Yes, uh, King loves The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, he, in his... In his uh, nonfiction book about horror, he spends a good 40 pages talking about that book specifically. Cool. Um, I don't really I don't really know that reference, so I'm not going to say much, but uh, that, that's neat. It's a very good book. Um, you should read it. I will. Someday. <laughs> Unplucked Gem says their favorite reference uh, is the whole book, 112263, trying to stop the assassination of real-life President JFK. King did huge extensive research on the shooting in Oswald and added so much detail and history on the kind of guy Lee Harvey Oswald was. I learned a lot about the story through through this fictional tale. And then he, they say it actually changed my mind on who killed JFK. What? <laughs> um, that's that's uh, that's that's. It, <laughs> when was that book written relative to this one? I just think it's really uh, funny that they use the idea of of stopping the JFK assassination in this book as like a, a, a thought experiment. And he actually that, wrote a book about that. Yeah. That book came out after, I think it came out in uh, like 2010 or 11. It's hilarious. So, um, yeah. I think that's just something that was on Stephen King's mind and he decided to write a whole book about it. Uh, 11, 22, 63 is a really good book. And so I think we've talked about my like a hundred greatest books of all time list, whatever that I'm making myself read. Cause I'm insane. Um, it's one of the two Stephen King books on it. It's uh Carrie and is it Carrie? Yeah, I think it's Carrie and eleven twenty two sixty three are the two Stephen King books on that list. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. I would have picked like The Shining or The Stand, but whatever. Yeah. I think this is a good book. It's a good book. All right. Uh, Para Jane says, I love when Stephen King references his own work as fiction because it really provides a mind fuck when you start digging into it. I think the first instance of King writing his his own work in his fiction was in the dead zone when a girl freaks out and says, it's like in that movie, Carrie. <laughs> I remember that, too. Um, I reread both books recently, and the dead zone is in a universe where Carrie is a movie presumably based on the book by Stephen King, while being unaware that the dead zone is also a book by Stephen King. But Carrie is the same universe as his later story, The Body, because Teddy Duchamp runs into the gas station in Chamberlain. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, Eddie is from a universe where The Shining is a movie, but when they all cross over into the universe of The Stand, Eddie doesn't recognize anything, so we can guess that either The Stand didn't exist in Eddie's win, or they never heard of it. So is Stephen King wrote The Shining, but not The Stand, or maybe since both references are to movie, Stephen King didn't write... <laughs> uh, different levels of the tower. It's fun. It's just so fun. I love it. All right. Uh, Geek2Live says they really love it when the content get close to Lud and hear the drums, a.k.a. the ZZ Top bass track. It really comes out of nowhere and increases the uncertainty of the world they're in. Yeah, uh, and Peter Parker, Spider-Man, also says, of course, a song called Velcro Fly by ZZ Top. Mm -hmm. I think we said this when, when we got to that part in the book, but if you go to the YouTube video for Velcro Fly, everyone in the comments is talking about the Dark Tower, <laughs> and that's the greatest thing ever. It is so fun. I love it, yeah. Uh, Joe Cool SO4 says their favorite reference in the Dark Tower series uh, is the reference to the Wizard of Oz. At first, you get tiny little hints that make you think of Dorothy, Toto, and the rest of the gang. But in the end, Roland is walking on the yellow brick road wearing ruby cowboy boots, clicking the heels to enter the Emerald City um, to meet Oz the Great and Terrible after uh, Toto slash Oi pulls back the curtain. 
Um, and this is so much over the top and the fact that Jake, Eddie, and Susanna recognize these parallels and are so weirded out by experiencing all of it and even making jokes about it. And, and, and that's what makes it so relatable. Um, the, the, they, say, the, they say, my question is how this fits in Matt's midworld is the future theory. Yeah, do you still support that theory? And uh, how does I it mean, fit? I mean, uh, it's not my most preferred theory at this point, but if I had to fit it into the theory, I would just say um, that someone built a literal emerald palace somewhere for fun based on <laughs> the um, the Wizard of Oz books. Okay. Um, I think I think that point that, like, the Wizard of Oz reference is one of the first ones that, like, everyone in our story or almost everyone in our story, like knows what's up mm -hmm. and like gets the reference is pretty significant because yeah we've had a lot of references throughout these stories but most of the time our characters are just like uh -huh. um but this one is like wait wait our, our characters are having the same reaction we the reader are having. yeah well because because it's the difference between like a fantasy author like cutely referencing arthurian legend in, in a way where it's it, like winking to the author and having the characters look at the camera and be like, is this Arthurian legend? Like, <laughs> right, like it's right. a completely different thing that he's doing with the story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, next we have DB, who first and most importantly says um, that they support my podcast idea for Dance McPadre. Um, well, I think I said, I think I said Dance Pacabre. Pacabre. Dance Pacabre. Pacabre. <laughs> I think it's perfect, and I don't understand why you're so hateful, Matt. But thank you, DB, for supporting that. Um, they also go on to say my absolute favorite pop culture reference in this series is the Katet finding ruby slippers and clicking their heels together. There's no topping it. Picture always little booties, how he needed help to put his little paws together. It broke my brain. And they go on to say, I grew up reading the Oz books because my mother is a huge fan. She is also a constant reader and introduced me to King's work when I got older. The tribute to L. Frank Baum in Wizard and Glass has extra significance for me as the copy I was reading came from the family bookshelf that's a wonderful little story yeah i like it love it love it lynette b says the use of hey jude once again uh, the song does an excellent job establishing tone and mood for the series jude being the patron saint of lost causes okay i didn't know that <laughs> neither did i that does set the tone <laughs> he was more lost than roland looking for the tower they say, I was pretty young when I read The Gunslinger for the first time, sixth or seventh grade, but my parents were Beatles fans and I knew the song. So it was this trippy clue that I was not in our world, but close to our world kind of story. It set me up to expect all those strange next door references and prepared me for the timey-wimey stuff. That song mirrors the action of the book nicely, too. It starts slow, but builds into this chaotic maelstrom of sound by the end. Sounds which would well accompany the destruction of Tull as well as the earlier actions of Walter over the body of Nort. Nort! That was his name. <laughs> yeah. They say they could just hear the piano going crazy as he jumps back and forth faster and faster, becoming a blur over Nort's corpse. Um, King telling us that the song was being played in tolls like a warning to buckle up because shit's about to get strange. Yeah, I love it. Great. Love it. That's, that's more in-depth analysis of Jude than I think I've i've figured out so thanks yeah yeah steve d actually has more to say about it though i've got to go with hey jude the song or at least this version of it was heard early in the gunslinger and continues to pop up in the series it was an early indication that of uh, early indication that our world and roland's world are connected i can't quite put my finger on why this song continues to show up yes it's a perfect song sing along song in a bar and saloon and certainly a song that will be known for generations but like all good writers king chose this song for a deeper reason right yes steve lynette just pointed that out for you in my mind it's it's a song about trying to find the positive side of a bad situation i imagine the people of midworld are also trying to find the bright side of life yes that's true. i like that hey. i like that as well yeah hey jude is a song about um um uh john lennon's death right jude is Lennon's kid, right? John, I'm pretty sure. I thought it was. I thought John Lennon was singing a song to his like son about something about him about sorry, sorry, I'm a bad person. I don't know. I don't remember. I'm not a Beatles expert at all. I don't ever pretend to be one. So if I just said something really stupid, that's fine because I don't know anything about the Beatles. I don't know. I I, I think it, I think. The, 
I think it it came out right around John Lennon's death, but I don't think it was about John Lennon's death. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I I thought it was John Lennon's song, so that's why. No, no, no. Paul McCartney wrote it. Okay. Well, I don't fucking shit. Anyway, it was written by Paul McCartney (laughs) and created and credited to the John Lennon McCartney partnership. Uh, okay. That doesn't mean uh, I'm moving Lennon on. I'm moving, moving yes. on. I don't know. <laughs> this is not my uh, comparative advantage. Um, Daniel M says, up to this point, my favorite has to be um, the first of the series. Hey Jude popping up in a Western really sets the tone of, of weirdness yet to come. Honorable mention for the offhanded nature with which Eddie tossed in a shining reference that made, that made me scratch my head a bit, especially since the whole Stephen King as a character stuff was unbeknownst to me at the time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, so next we have Jake D who says, finally, I'm caught up and can participate in the discussion question. So I had several to choose from, but I was reading next week's chapters and came across one that I don't think I would have caught. And I'm not sure I had others on the journey caught before this. Uh, in the section with Callahan meeting Walter in the way station, Callahan says, get away from me. And Walter responds with, nope, I can't go for that. No can do. Oh, that's yeah, that's the Hollow Notes. <laughs> yes, uh, the Hollow Notes lyrics that I talked about. Yeah, I caught it, Jake. Um, it, but it was a really great catch. Well done. Well done. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Luke V says, when it comes to references, it's hard to argue that the best ones come from the man in black himself, Mr. Randy, Randy Flagg. <laughs> uh, he's known for his his penchant for making references only the reader would understand, giving us a sense of sharing an inside joke with him, often at the expense of our overly competent Roland. My favorite <laughs> reference thus far comes from this week's reading in section 18 of chapter 9. Flag makes a reference to Roland's encounter with the Lobstrosities, an event that has yet to occur at the time of saying it, which, of course, is being recalled during Callahan's flashback. Not only is Walter giving the audience a little wink to such a memorable moment in, in the series with the use of the Lobstrosities gibberish, but he, he is doing so in the actual way station where we first met Jake while the silhouettes of both Jake and Roland disappear into the horizon. The amount of mental gymnastics King goes through to make such a spectacular scene-slash-reference happen is a testament to his genius, and is the reason why this particular reference is my favorite. Yeah, I mean, that goes along with uh, what I what I was kind of implying that I feel like he's read the Dark Tower series. <laughs> the, 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 the man in black is referencing, you know, Donna Chuck is something that you would only say if you had actually read the Dark Tower. Yeah, so. yeah. It, it is entirely meaningless to Callahan. Yeah. And, and yeah, and yeah, yeah, he wasn't there. He was already dead when that happened. Right. He so, was, well, dead, quote unquote, dead. Um, yes. And and why would you say dead a chuck? Like why? Like if somebody's going to get eaten by lions, you say like growl, Roar. like like, yes. like it's 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 a characteristic thing of the actual text of the actual book. Anyway, yeah, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. We'll see. Um, next up we have Jer who says, based on where y'all at, I'll say in wizard and glass, the Kansas city monarchs who are the most successful Negro league teams on our level of the tower being an MLB fan, MLB team in that version of the USA. I did not know that actually. I did not know that this was a, a the Kansas city, uh, black league team from, from yesteryear. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty cool. It made me think of the sidebar of questions as a baseball fan, did they just have the same name as a team in our reality? Did the NL also exist in that reality and the Monarchs were integrated into the MLB at some point? I love that the, that the Dark Tower makes you question things like this. That's really cool. I, I did not know that about the Monarchs. It's really cool. Yes, I know less about baseball than I know about the Beatles, so I had no idea. But thanks for, thanks for telling us. That's cool. Hey, Jude, hit a home run. That's, that's, uh, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, <laughs> Jeremy says... I've got to say that every Ramones reference makes me happy. Greatest rock and roll band ever. Gaba Gaba Hey. (laughs) Did you get that one, Matt? Nope. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Moving on. Uh, Next week's question, folks. I think this is another fun one. Um, What is your favorite told tale in storytelling? In honor of the end of part two of Wolves of the Kala telling tales. What is your favorite told tale in storytelling? And this means of course uh, a moment where a character is sharing a story to another character in a story and we flash into and actually see that story being told so it's been done a lot in this series so far but this is not the only series in which it's done so you can pick something from the dark tower up until this point of course or you can pick anything else what is your favorite told tale in storytelling and i think most importantly on this question 
why? Why do you do you like it so much? Why do you think this is good? Why do you think this is a, a device that strengthens the book um, and doesn't detract from it? Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. That is it for us here on Kingslingers this week on another very long episode of Kingslingers. Next week, we begin part three, The Wolves, by reading and discussing chapters one and two of that section. We're in part three. We're in the the last third of the book now, Matt, and the wolves. It's called the wolves. So they're going to presumably be here. Are we going to find out what they look like? Maybe. (laughs) No, no, not not in this book. (laughs) Silly Matt. Uh, Remember, you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, the subreddit r slash doof media is the place to go to answer the discussion questions um, primarily. Yeah, yeah. But any of those other places work. We get a lot of emails too. Sure, but, sure. Uh, the subreddit's always fun. Yeah. Because then you can comment on other people's answers too and say, I agree with you, good sir or madam. Um, if you're not already subscribed to King Slingers, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world. You can listen to these things called podcasts. That's right. Uh, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. If you donate at the $20 level, you can force us to do an episode of our variety podcast on a movie of your choice. So basically make me and Scott talk about a movie in any movie you want for, you know, for an hour, basically. Yeah. And I mean, someone, one of our listeners out there, one of you have already taken us up on this because not this week's episode, but next week's episode of the Doofcast, we will be doing an episode on uh, The Mist, the adaptation of Stephen King's short story of the same name. So um, you folks can make us do all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Uh, this week, special thanks to new patrons, the Doofs Mator, Trent Z, and Dan V, and new Doof Dancer level patron, uh, J Rake, the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master, yeah. Yes, welcome and thank you so much. Yes, thank you everyone. Um, thank you everyone that continues to support us. We really do, really do appreciate this. Um, but if you cannot afford to donate to us, that is absolutely okay. As I always say, you can help us by sharing the podcast. Please keep sharing share share and share alike it's uh the more you share the more you're gonna get yeah the set song from all dogs go to heaven (laughs) exactly (laughs) um also you can help us out by leaving a rating and a review this week's spotlight review comes from flandy fook who gives us five stars and says oh the nostalgia oh discordia i've traveled with the content three times to the tower and i'm absolutely enjoying this new perspective the hosts being a longtime fan and a newbie really works i always long to share my favorite books with a friend and this is a great exciting way to experience it through a fresh set of eyes both hosts are also very knowledgeable and provide excellent analysis of the text any tower junkie should enter this ride good job fellas hope we make it all the way oh flandy fook you don't have to worry about that we're we're not stopping this ride we couldn't if we wanted to we're going all the way that's right all right folks we will see you here next week as we begin the last third of wolves of the cala long days and pleasant nights may you have twice the number Remember when we said um, we wanted the episodes under two hours? What if we just pretend like we said two and a half and then we did it?